all of you can do. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a pretty full agenda, so let's get going. Uh, first thing is to approve the agenda. Does anyone have any questions, issues regarding the agenda as it was presented? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. I got a motion by Sean Ryan to approve the agenda. Uh, second by Rick Seidler. If there's no other comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the agenda is approved. Mike, the appointments, do we need to go through each one or? If you want to take them all in one fell swoop, that would be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, just a quick thing, a city attorney, we, uh, Scott Riggs, is uh, asking to re-up again uh, regarding the council appointments. Uh, I heard back from Bruce, he was fine with what he had, I didn't hear that from anyone else, so I'm going to recommend the the same um, council uh, members to the boards and commissions. Um, city council vice president, I think we need to discuss that. Right now, Sean Ryan is the vice president. I'd like to nominate Maggie if I could. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Got a second on that. So we will include that in the thing that uh, we have Maggie uh, as vice president. And that was by Rick Seiler, second by Sean Ryan. John didn't get to do it too much, so maybe... I didn't. <laughs> uh, city personnel, uh, again, City Administrator Mike Johnson, Police Chief James Clouds, Planning Community Director Ken Andage, Public Works Director Glenn Stika, Utilities General Manager Bruce Reimers, and Finance Director Patty Sohai. Uh, next thing, uh, item E has to deal with the official depositories. Uh, there we have Round Bank again, First Bank and Trust, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo Advisors, and the, the new one must be the Minnesota Municipal Money Market Fund. Designated official newspaper. I don't know, I heard the Montgomery Messenger was asking about it, but uh, <laughs> I think we'll probably... Uh, we appoint the New Craig Times. Uh, city engineer, Chris Abbott is here. Um, city advisor is uh, Terry Deaton with Baker Tilly. And then city council, city bond council is Sophia Lake. Likey. Likey. And is she taking care of, she's replacing um, Bob? Yes. Bob also? No, 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 oh. Bob also. Uh, he needs to work with Scott on some of the HR and some of the other matters. Uh, it was John Utley, who oh, yeah, John. Just used to be, and this last month he did in 19, he retired earlier this year, and uh, the other person who did, Kennedy Graven, that has taken over the bond council role for most of the cities is uh, Miss Sophia Leike. Okay. And then the final thing, Jay, is uh, the fire department did have their elections, and uh, Chief Jeremy Kukowski was re-elected. Chief two was Steve Rinda. Chief three was Kurt Novotny. Captain one was Greg Pint. Captain two was Brad Novak. Captain three was Brandon Bush. Lieutenant one was Mark Novak. Lieutenant two was Bob Connolly. And training officer is Steve Rinda and secretary is Brad Novak. Does anyone have any questions or concerns on anything in um, regarding the appointment? No. Did I go through fast enough for you? Yep. Okay. So basically, uh, I will make a motion to approve the appointments as recommended. Uh, the only change uh, would be having Maggie Bass as vice president. Uh, besides that, uh, I think everything else is as the recommended uh, in our package. Second. I've got a second by Rick Seiler. Any other questions or comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. That was easy enough. Most years that would have been the one and only item for the agenda. I know, yeah. I want to see. 
Yeah, most years they would have been in that city club by now. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, Chris, are you going to take this? I believe so. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, the, the item here before your consideration are three items related to the 2020 Main Street Improvement Project. Um, list them in order here, resolution for force account agreement, uh, another resolution for the detour agreement with MnDOT, and the other is a resolution approving plans and specifications and ordering advertisement for bids. Uh, the first force account agreement, just to explain it in simple terms, is it is a process through the state aid program and through these type of projects that allows us to use city forces for certain types of work. Um, in this case, it's basically for the lighting, a portion of the lighting improvements. Um, there'll be a portion that will be bid as part of the project for the contractor. That's things like uh, the underground uh, conduit and the foundations, but really felt that it was in the best interest of the city and the public to have the um, uh, utility commission do the furnish and install the lights, the poles, the fixtures, and wire them. Um, and we actually go through a process that we have to do through through state aid to show that it is actually more cost effective and, and in the public's best interest to do that. So that's what that force account agreement does. It basically allows the, the city uh, utility, we pray utility commission to do the lighting work um, and to take that out of the bid contract. It also allows um, um, Bruce and his crews to order those uh, fixtures ahead of time or whenever we feel it's the most appropriate time to do that. So again, which we can do in advance of, of the actual bid work as well. The detour agreement is pretty straightforward. Um, this is standard procedure for MnDOT um, that whenever they do a detour off their system onto a local system, whether that be county or city, uh, they do an agreement process that not only identify the route, but also provides for some reimbursement by moving uh, traffic to those local roads. In this case, there will be an agreement with Lasua County. They've got a very similar agreement, and then an agreement with the city to use that those portions of the detour route that are city. So that'll be 10th Avenue, as well as what's the old County Road 37, which is now, of course, 10th Avenue Northeast and 7th Street, uh, Northeast and Northwest. Um, the rest of it basically gets that back onto the Trunk Highway 21, so on the, on the state's um, system. So that, again, is pretty straightforward, uh, that agreement. And they have a process they go through to calculate uh, a revenue amount that they will pay the locals. And I, here they're showing an estimated about 14580 and they show up for a maximum and that was based on if there's something went a lot longer. And again, we would, wouldn't be expecting it to go longer than that. And all those roads, of course, are um, what we call 10 ton roads, so they're high, high, high strength roads. Um, the contract uh, with the contractor will have a clause in there for if there's any need for some type of repair on the, uh, um, the detour routes during the project, they would be obligated to take care of that. Again, we shouldn't expect anything unless it's something uh, unique or minor. Uh, the last item, uh, again, for your consideration, um, we are in the final approval process with MnDOT. In fact, we've, we've, we've gone through multiple step re review processes. We are currently have gone through what we call central office review. We've gotten those comments back and we're literally uh, expecting to submit them tomorrow um, and are expecting uh, their final approval with probably within the next week or so. Um, uh, some of that has to be coordinated with state aid and, and, and they've confirmed the kind of the funding obligations because of different funding funding sources, state, uh, federal grant that we have federal money, state money, state aid, et cetera. And so they're kind of finalizing those, those cost participation. So, but with that, we are at the point where we're ready to advertise for bids. Um, we can't advertise until we have the final green light from MnDOT. Again, we're kind of expecting it soon. So right now, at this point, we are proposing and anticipate a bid opening on February 21st. 
Um, there is a slight chance that if there's some delay in the, uh, um, the cooperative agreement process, um, it might get bumped and we'd probably be looking at about two weeks. And the reason I say that is MnDOT bids all their projects the last Friday of the month and we don't want to bid the same time MnDOT's bidding all their projects. So we would either go the week before or the week after. And so right now, um, again, we're showing the week before, the 21st of February, and uh, it, right now that seems pretty reasonable like that should be able to be accomplished. So I guess with that, I'm probably forgetting something. I wrote this report about uh, a few days before Christmas, so it's a little vague in my memory. So I don't know if there's anything I may have forgotten or questions you might have. So. Did anyone have any questions regarding that? three uh, resolutions that are we need to address regarding the 2020 street project not the resolutions themselves but um mike has our attorney will give you the agreements thank you i figured as much but i, I think yes. <laughs> okay any other comments or questions would it disappoint you, for you to take <laughs> well i did find a typo but <laughs> <laughs> That was Scott's the, plan there. No, the agreements are from the state. I know, I know. <laughs> but I found a typo. Yeah, we don't, we don't read correct here. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, I can imagine why. <laughs> okay, if there's no other comments, I guess I'll look for, we'll do all three of them separately. Uh, the first is a resolution uh, regarding the, uh, what do you call that, federal participation uh, of uh, the force account agreement. Force account agreement. So moved. Okay. Second. A second. A motion by Rick Seiler, second by Bruce Wolf. There's no other comments on that one. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, that passes 5 0. We are just to bring up uh, at this point on that one, on that lighting agreement, that uh, Bruce has installed one of the uh, new street lights for downtown. Uh, he has it installed at the entrance to the electric line garage on uh, First <coughs> Avenue North. And so if you drive by the entrance, you'll be able to see, right Bruce, I'm not taking our turn, that uh, you'll get a feel for, that's the tall one. No, that's, it's actually, they're all the same, other than one will have two lights on it, and the other will be a single fixture light, so you can take a look <coughs> at it. And this is a single? No, it's got a double fixture this light. This one's a double? Yep. So it's what'll be in the core of downtown. So. In fact, if you think about it, you're out at night, you can drive by and take a look at what it's going to look like. Is that just a display then, so it'll be taken down then, or is it a turn match and all that? Yeah, actually, it'll probably turn into one of our spares. Thank you. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for that, Mike. interruption. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the detour agreement as presented for Trunk Highway number 19 detour. Okay. I will second that. So I got a motion by Bruce Wolf, second by Chuck Nikolai. There's no other comments on that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, that passes five zero. And the third one, uh, resolution approving the plans or in the uh, advertisement of bids. I assume we are going to pass this resolution, noting that once we get final approval, contingent on final state or state approval. Okay. I guess I'll make a motion to approve uh, ordering the advertisement of bids. Contingents on state approval. A second. Okay. Go ahead. I get a second by Maggie Bass. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes five zero. Good. Thank, Thank you very much. Ken, I think you're up on the next one. So tonight we have a proposal from uh, SEH and specifically to uh, carry out our uh, state aid engineering services for uh, the 2020 year. Uh, last year we had had Chris come in and he did a uh, more detailed overview on the state aid system, uh, our routes that we have uh, within town. I've just got the map up on the order for you. Of all of our local state aid routes that are kind of highlighted in pink here. Um, so we won't go into that level of detail tonight, but um, I'll give you the kind of the nitty gritty on what we've got going on tonight. So uh, compared to last year's contract, uh, the proposal is only up $200 uh, from last year. So $6,800 versus $6,600 for the uh, yearly uh, work. Uh, in 2019, Chris was on the um, review board. Uh, uh, 
Screen, screen board. City, uh, City yeah. Engineer Screening Board. Yeah. And uh, that was some additional funding we had to put in to have Chris serve that role, and that's kind of a rotating uh, position, but we do not have that expense for 2020. Um, other than knowing the contract, I did want to point out that um, general fund dollars aren't actually used for uh, state aid engineering services. We actually utilize the uh, gas tax funds that we do receive. And so that is actually what's paying for our, the engineering services and Chris's time, uh, not our general tax dollars. But uh, we're expecting about $93,000, almost $94,000 in uh, state aid maintenance funds for 2020. And then obviously we have our allotment of uh, construction dollars as well <clears throat> that we also received in 2020. Um, so with that, I really don't have anything more to note. Uh, we have kind of a breakdown at the very end, and I don't have an overhead of this, of our uh, last page of the memo in yellow, the uh, maintenance allocation that we're expecting for 2020 and then estimating out in the future, as well as those construction uh, dollars which are just under $282,000 for 2020. And then we're expecting at some point um, uh, taking in advance of some fundings for the uh, projects we have coming up here uh, in 2020. So if you have more detailed questions on that, Chris can certainly answer those for you. Ken, on page three, it says $6,900 lump sum. Is that a typo or? That's what I thought I had. No, I just can't uh, apparently write what we had. Oh, excuse me. The 20, we're only up $100 from 19 to 20, sorry. Oh, okay. So yes, it is correct, 6,900. Okay, so I'm from 6,800 to 60. Yep, so I'll just swap 100. Previous year, I had a $200 jump. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Make a motion to approve the proposal for MSA services with SEH as outlined. Okay. We've got a motion by Bruce Wolf, second by Rick Seiler. Uh, there's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? It passes 5 0. Mike, I see that Tom's not here. Do you want to kind of. Um, included your packet tonight is a proposal uh, that's being recommended from the uh, Detroit Golf Board to uh, consider a golf management consultant agreement with Mr. Kurt Beeling as Golf Professional Enterprises LLC. Uh, uh, I put GP for short. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make the, the switch real quickly from GME to GPE, but that was my brief attempt at it as we go through this. Um, the board met uh, last week. Uh, uh, it was last week. It was the second. January 2nd. Yeah, but uh, I've got so many time with the reason here. I can't uh, keep them all straight. But uh, they, they met to, to choose uh, uh, or select uh, the uh, golf manager for this coming year because as of uh, the end of December, uh, Mr. Wade Brown and Golf Management Enterprises had discontinued their agreement with the city to provide those services. Uh, Wade and GME had provided, uh, uh, I'll continue and he can augment them if he wants to. Uh, Tom, I'm just doing your job, so uh, <laughs> if I miss anything, uh, just uh, feel free to uh, pitch in. Uh, that GME had provided service to the city since February of 2011 or for the past nine years. It seems just like yesterday that uh, you know we entered into that agreement and uh, lo and behold, it's nine years later. All of the employees under GME were also uh, uh, terminated uh, effective December 31st. Uh, after taking a look at uh, and reviewing and discussing the merits of uh, entering into the agreement, ultimately the golf board voted six to zero to recommend to the council uh, to enter into the agreement with uh, GPE uh, as uh, attached in, in, our, in their minutes. The proposed effective date is back to January 1, 2020. Uh, it's being recommended for a one-year term, uh, January 1 through December 31st, and has a proposed contract amount of $73,333, or $6,111 uh, a month. 
There are no other employees included in the contract. Under the previous arrangement, there's budgetary allocations where uh, uh, the uh, employees that uh, served in the capacity in food and beverage and in, in one other golf position part-time monies are included in the 2020 uh, golf budget uh, to pick uh, up an allocation of about $30,000 uh, for those part-time employees. Um, effective uh, the end of the year, uh, uh, Mr. Reeling uh, acquired uh, GME and uh, converted over the uh, ownership to uh, doing business as golf professional enterprises. Uh, everything uh, is in order at the, the state from that standpoint. Uh, Mr. Reeling is taking, I believe, on Thursday his uh, food uh, test so that he can become a certified food manager. Uh, that was one of, uh, obviously, my biggest worries in the transition uh, from GME to uh, GPE or any gaps in there. But there is a provision under the uh, health regulations that uh, we have up to 60 days to replace. If a certified food manager leaves, we have up to 60 days to replace that position. I thought we necessarily had to have somebody in place, but uh, subsequently learned after talking with uh, LaSour County, uh, the food safety people there, that uh, we've got 60 days under the, under the state regs. Uh, background uh, investigation was uh, uh, completed and everything was clean there. Uh, I'm waiting for a certificate of insurance, which is required to be produced within 10 days after your approval of the contract, if you do so tonight. Um, and he also has uh, the uh, liquor certification and training that is required under the contract. So everything is technically in, in order. Uh, if you recall, going back to the budget process, that there had been a, a dollar amount uh, allocated with a modification. Uh, uh, bringing it back to the 73,000 numbers, so uh, the contract amount does uh, comply or is consistent with what has been budgeted for 2020. So uh, with that, after they weighed uh, the alternatives of uh, the option of uh, handling this through the contract manager or looking at trying to uh, look at it as a golf manager position within the city, which would have been the more expensive option, uh, as well as probably losing a, a significant amount of time here in January and February with the hope that we'd have somebody in place by March. Uh, the golf board didn't feel like they wanted to run the risk of uh, not staying current with trying to get uh, memberships uh, uh, put in place uh, in the first quarter of the year, as well as trying to make sure uh, contact could be made with all of the scheduled events so that we don't lose that. And then I'm not sure who's buying all the lottery tickets for the weather this year that, uh, uh, as you know, this last year, 2019, was the worst year in Minnesota for wet weather, uh, which did impact the golf operations. So everybody's crossing their fingers in the hopes that we're going to have uh, a better, drier weather, because if we have that for the golf course, then that will certainly help the road construction project through the middle of downtown. So uh, we're hoping that this is a dry and dusty summer. Uh, most part but uh, otherwise everything's in order and as I said the golf board approved uh, the recommendation to you on a six to nothing vote uh, on the January 2nd minutes. Tom do you want to add anything? I don't really have anything to add I think Mike covered it quite well and um, there was not extensive discussion at our golf board other than all the items that Mike went through and um, we all approved the motion to um, into the contract with uh, GPE for the year of 2020. I just got a quick question. You got guys laid off, right? They would be the uh, full-time mechanic and uh, superintendent for the month of January. Yes, those, those so are they're, the. They're uh, laid off under the old uh, management company. No, no, they were never part of the management company. They're the full-time city employees. Okay, so there's not going to be any um, reciprocity issues. The new contract and the old contract. No, no, it doesn't relate to the individuals that were laid out for changing. Cool. Thank you.
I have some questions, but I just want to clarify because I thought, I thought what I heard you say, Mike, was that uh, GPE or Kurt bought out GME and is running GPE as a DBA? Doing business as GPE. So our contract then would be with GME, the previous company, doing business <coughs> as GPE? No. Kurt, you want to? No, I. <coughs> excuse me. Um, GPE is registered with the uh, Secretary of State as its own. So GPE is a limited liability company? Yes. Yes. You see yes. as a DBA. No. So I think what Kurt did is he basically bought the assets of GME and then set up his own company as GPE LLC. Correct? Oh, correct. Yes. Correct. Okay. So it's not a DBA. No. Okay. Then on page. Um, <coughs> Exhibits, I should say. A, B, it's fourth paragraph down. I did not understand the first sentence. Um, fourth bullet point oversee all golf operations through regular contact and interaction with city staff assigned to golf course and other employees. That's the part that I don't really understand. Where are you at? Uh, page A, A, fourth bullet point, first sentence. on golf operations through regular contact interaction with city staff assigned to golf course. Is that meant to say assigned to the golf course and other employees? Yeah, thank you. I think it should be assigned to you, Mike. Come after uh, probably after assigned to the golf course. Assigned to the golf course. It should be assigned to the golf course. ED should be. Key. Is that what you're saying? Well, that, I, I'm thinking that's meaning that if we have a city staff that's going to be doing something at the golf course, then Kurt would have to interact with the person. Right. But it's not really saying where it's kind of muddy. Like, Assigned, right? It seems like what it should say. You see, it, Mike? Yeah. I think it should be assigned, ED. Unless it's supposed to mean something else. I'm not. Let's go with it as that. Then the next bullet point. I'm just trying to understand. Maybe you could just talk about how the supervision works, uh, because it's talking about performance evaluations, which I'm totally comfortable with, but. Um, is that how it actually would work, where this uh, curve would supervise the superintendent mechanics and provide performance evaluations for those people? Is that what was done last year? Okay. So all staff that are assigned to the golf course, he would be supervising? Yes. Okay. <coughs> And then the scope of services in general, I, I like what the scope of services says, but I'm wondering are the time going to be associated with any of these activities, particularly implementation of a management plan? Is it, what, what, is, what are we asking for with that? I guess uh, what we are working on, uh, the, the golf board is actively working with Kurt on our marketing. Uh, advertising plan um, so we are putting that in and, and hope to have timelines uh, associated with that for the upcoming meeting I believe Kurt yes. and um, I guess a management plan I guess if that's something different I'm not aware of that but um, we are actively putting together plans and timelines for this year uh, to bring in a few more events and um, better spend our advertising dollars and um, increase our social media presence and um, Kurt's definitely going to be working on that as putting together a timeline. I wonder if the uh, golf board could just at one of its next meetings take a look at this and try to provide some kind of timeline so there's good communication between Kurt and, and us and the committee. Just what are the expectations? 
for when this stuff will be due. And if, we're, if we're saying this, there's a requirement for management plan, just to have an idea, is that going to be next month, two months from now, that type of thing? You know, it's been somewhat difficult when you take a look at it, it really comes down to, uh, you know, it, it ends up being the, the budget plan uh, in, in, in a certain sense as far as, uh, you know, we have two full-time and then you've got part-time in about three sectors of the golf budget. And so from a management or employee standpoint, it's really directed by what is made available on a part-time basis in those respective areas. There has not been the scope of revenues when you take a look at some of the short and long range operations as it relates to capital equipment or capital replacement items. There have not been the resources due to the uh, operational aspects over the last several years. So it's been very limiting in, uh, in, in that sense. And so uh, it's uh, been very difficult to uh, forecast any significant long range operation when we're dealing with some of the weather related items that we've had in the last couple of years that have impacted both memberships and uh, green fee uh, operations. I would totally agree. I just want to uh, encourage that there's good communication about expectations right off the bat. So Kurt is comfortable that he has an idea of what's expected of him. And we, as we will look at this on a monthly basis, have a feeling our expectations being met or, or not or whatever. And we understand the weather and the complications of that, but the management plan, as you say, would include whatever goals that you have in, in mind and marketing things you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Three sure. email blasts by May, you're gonna do this by June, whatever. But whatever you guys feel is the appropriate expectations that you're gonna lay out with timelines on them so we have a good understanding so we're not seeing it then December saying well I expected that you're going to do this and this wasn't done and that wasn't done well um, I just don't want to be in that kind of position so I'm just encourage whatever kind of set of goals or guidelines or management plan or whatever you want that to look like that 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 gets some attention yeah and I'm that, totally supportive yep. of the, what what you guys worked on yeah I think that's a great idea and, and definitely the framework of our last golf board discussion that we want something on paper and, and something we can track and, and that has been part of our discussion before and just quite frankly it hasn't been done but if we have a plan put together um, it is it will give us something more we can physically track yeah and, and of course we might want to say we're going to do 25,000 rounds but it's not necessarily whether you do 25,000 rounds, if you do the action plans or the steps that we wanted you to do to try to get us to be in a position to get 25,000 rounds. You know, at the end of the year, we might only have 16. But if you did everything we asked of you, then sure, that's fine. Sure. Okay, any other comments? <clears throat> any other questions or anything for Tom or Mike? I guess I'll look for a motion to approve the uh, agreement with GPP. So moved. Motion by Sean Ryan. I'll second. Second by Maggie Bass. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, it passes 5 0. Thanks, Tom. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Good luck, Kurt. <laughs> Next, uh, we have the Memorial presentation. Patrick and his entourage. Prepare, if you don't mind, I'll give a little bit of background as to uh, why we're here tonight and uh, what we're uh, hoping to accomplish with uh, having representatives of uh, North Memorial Health here. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Pat Coyne, Vice President of Ambulance Services. Terrence Nelson, who is uh, the regional manager for Fairbolt, Wasika, and New Prague. And then last but not least, one of the more powerful local people we have in the, in the uh, ambulance system is Lisa Kayser, uh, one of the paramedics, right? EMT. 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 Excuse me for that. Anyway, that uh, as you take a look at it, the uh, current uh, contract for ambulance service that we have with 
North Memorial uh, Healthcare uh, is uh, due to expire on April uh, 30th uh, of this year. Uh, we first uh, entered into an agreement with uh, North Memorial uh, back in uh, 2010 and began a partnership and a relationship uh, where we uh, moved the city from uh, an all-volunteer city system uh, to an arrangement with North Memorial Health with the goal and the hope that we were going to change from a BLS, a basic life support system, to an ALS, advanced life support or paramedic-based uh, service. Uh, that contract was initially for five years. Uh, it uh, was completed uh, at the end of that five-year term in uh, April of 2015, at which time uh, the city negotiated and entered into a continuation of pretty much uh, the same uh, ambulance service agreement and building lease uh, with North Memorial for an additional five years. Uh, thus uh, is why we're here today because it'll be expiring here the end of uh, April. At that time when we entered into that agreement, uh, the hospital was operated under, uh, it, known, it was known as Queen of Peace. And uh, at that time, the hospital had a contractual arrangement with North Memorial Healthcare to uh, run the uh, emergency uh, room at the hospital at that time. And so it was when I arrived in 08 and 09 that we uh, slowly moved into putting this agreement together with uh, North Memorial Healthcare and uh, entered into, uh, and now uh, here we are uh, finishing the 10th uh, year of that arrangement. Uh, they've grown that capability where we are currently uh, staffed, and they'll go into it a little bit more, with two 24-hour advanced life support ambulance crews, one that uh, generally is scheduled to be at the station and avail available for uh, immediate deployment, and the second crew is an on-call uh, basis to back up the primary unit 24 hours uh, a day. So we have 24-hour ALS service uh, uh, at the present time. I'll go through after they complete uh, their presentation today, I'll go through the ambulance service contract and the uh, building uh, lease agreement. Um, part of the other reason is that we're trying to get it onto the agenda is, uh, although I knew we were headed in this direction, I just didn't know it was gonna happen this quick, is that uh, Pat, uh, as Vice President of Ambulance Services, will be retiring next week, and so, wanted to try to get this done and on the table with the council for consideration uh, uh, and action. And so I'll go into a little bit more when they get done, but I asked them here uh, because I think uh, the mayor and council member Ryan are the only two uh, that were here or were around as we went through uh, uh, some of this uh, previously in 2015. Um, and so I asked them to come in to provide a an overview to you as to who is North Memorial Healthcare uh, or Health now, as it's known, if, uh, it's gone through uh, a name change here uh, in the process. And so, wanted you to uh, learn a little bit about uh, the, the background of the uh, ambulance system, uh, as well as have them go over some of the uh, statistics and information of uh, uh, what the ambulance services look like uh, and, and most recently the last uh, several years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pat and uh, let his team uh, do the presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson, and uh, thank you to uh, all the uh, mayor and the city council members, both current and past, for uh, their support uh, of uh, North Memorial um, and allowing us to do what we love to do, the passion of ours is to provide emergency care to people, uh, to provide care and to help people along in, in their healing process. Um, at oftentimes, which is a very vulnerable uh, point in their, in their lives. Um, the journey over the past 10 years, I think, uh, I've characterized the, uh, uh, the agreement that we've had and uh, how we've worked with the city has, has been uh, very good. Uh, we've uh, encountered a couple of minor bumps along the way. I've always been able to pick up the phone, solve anything that's uh, going on, so it's been really a good relationship uh, uh, along the way. Um, we've uh, continued to invest in many things, and Terry, in a minute here, will take you along and show you um, 
uh, many of the changes that uh, we've made along the way that have been uh, very positive. Uh, we continue uh, to uh, invest, just recently purchased a brand new ambulance. Um, and so I continue to take proceeds and pour them in back into uh, the operation of the ambulance service so that it really is uh, the first rate in every regard. So speaking of first rate, I've got uh, two people with me, Terry and Lisa. Uh, Lisa uh, had the, uh, the uh, displeasure, pleasure, I'm not sure, <laughs> of uh, making the journey with us. She uh, came uh, across as one of the original members of uh, our team. And um, we'll have her come up here after Terry uh, shares some of our information with you. And just to let you know uh, a little bit about what that was like, because she can speak from, you know, as a community member and uh, somebody who's uh, been through it. So I'll turn it over to uh, Terry to give you the uh, the overview, but I'm going to put a plug in it for Terry, too. Um, you know, I am retiring, but uh, if you're not, we've got a cadre of people like Terry who are uh, very, very good emergency managers. And uh, just to give you an example of that, last night, obviously, you were probably aware there was a terrible incident down in Wasika, which we also uh, covered down there, and a police officer um, shot. And um, you know, I, I get a page from our dispatch center that gives me a heads up on this. And um, so I called uh, Terry, and I said, that, you know, what's going on? What do you need for resources? How can I help? And he's already there. He's already, you know, embedded in, so embedded in the communities that we serve, working with the police department, fire department, other rescue agencies, and he's got it all under control, and he's like, I don't need nothing, we're good, um, but he had it all you know, taken care of everything, including our team members, which are uh, really, uh, obviously, uh, the front line and, and their most important asset. So, uh, with that plug, I'll turn it over to Terry. <coughs> Good evening. Um, I'll just go over uh, there's a few slides. I'll go over, go through them. Uh, kind of an old, brief overview of North itself, um, and then we'll get into some of the new Craig uh, statistics and, and uh, what we do. Um, so North Memorial Health mission is to empower our customers to achieve the best health. That's meaning that when we interact with our, our uh, customers, uh, patients, uh, as you may call them, we try to give them the best uh, options when we're dealing with them, uh, advocate for them. Um, to make sure that they are, are receiving or have the best uh, health outcomes uh, after we meet with them and then depending on the destination that we go to. So we really try to include them in, in their health care when, uh, when we get interact with them. Uh, some quick facts about North Memorial. Uh, over 50 years of service, over 780 employees, um, over 100,000 requests for service um, within our whole organization, uh, 86 patient transports, um, we're about the size of Massachusetts, and we put all together our own state and our metro area. Uh, 125 ambulances and nine helicopters in service. Uh, in service. Um, our area, so if you look, uh, the white areas are our current ambulance bases within Wisconsin and Minnesota, and the red, the red ones are our air care uh, bases. So we actually have. Uh, air care city down at our Fairboat Airport, so we have close to access to air care as well, helicopter service, um, and without and throughout the state. Uh, some of our histories of success, as you can note, we have uh, several uh, different cities that we've uh, integrated into to help cover uh, EMS service, and they've done well. Um, again, New Prague, I got 2001, but it was 2010 when we started here. Um, some of the advantages advantages of North Health, uh, North Memorial Health, is uh, we're licensed to cover every level of care. Um, our OCA paramedics actually have additional training uh, on vents, pumps. We do CPAP patients, BiPAP patients, interfacility transports, um, numerous different medications. Uh, depending on what the sending facilities need, we can get them, um, and we can treat up to a critical care level up until the point we need air care um, or or one one whoever comes in. Um, some of our ambulance services division services, uh, we have a great dispatch uh, communication center, a great quality department. They do a lot of peer review, a lot of uh, uh, protocol review, always updating protocols, uh, making sure we're getting to the most uh, current uh, services uh, that are available out there to our customers. Uh, uh, air maintenance program, education, billing, IT services, and our administration. 
Uh, support services are medical direction, Mark Conrado, uh, is one of our MDs. Peter Caney is one of our newer MDs that does uh, help, help with medical direction. And Dr. Lilja um, is also one. We also provide a different medical direction for many uh, LA agencies. I'm actually kind of working with uh, New Craig Fire Department because they do respond on occasion with us. They, I did provide them with a copy of our protocols, first responder protocols. They're kind of looking at them. I said we can tailor them if they want to, if they ever want to work with us a little bit more closely so we're all on the same page when we're providing care to our, our community members. Again, we have the pre-review departments, staff education, uh, protocol development, like I mentioned earlier, we're always updating protocols, making sure we have the best quality of care for our customers out there. Um, and all of our EMTs in Mexico go through the scale uh, verification every year. We have uh, actually two times a year we have to go up and go through uh, semi-annual education, or treats, they call it, so semi-annual education. We go through whole education and uh, with new skills and uh, information. Our EMS, EMS education department provides uh, different services available out there, EMR, EMR refreshers, uh, EMT refreshers, PELs, uh, advanced cardiac life support or pediatric advanced life support classes. They do uh, customized training, long hop sum, summer conference up in the metro every year that provides education for uh, EMS uh, providers. Breezy Point EMS refresher of uh, Breezy Point, Minnesota, they do that every year for EMS providers. And as well, team, team member education, like I mentioned, we do twice a year, we have to go up and do more education. Besides, a lot of online education keeps up the, uh, the new uh, information that's out there. Uh, CATS is um, an accreditation for ambulance services. Uh, we've been accredited for some time. There are two, only three in the state of Minnesota. It's ourselves, North, uh, Mayo, and Alina. Um, and for the business owners, I'm not sure, we're also uh, ISO 9001 certified as well. Uh, some com community involvement we do within uh, our uh, region and our communities that we serve. Parades, county fairs, uh, demonstrations at youth groups. We do Girl Scouts. I think we just had the Girl Scouts at New Craig this <coughs> We had a group of Girl Scouts come through. Health fairs, uh, we do like the Zinky Days, all that, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're part of the chamber in each of our communities that we serve. Um, so we're, we try to really embed ourselves and become part of the community. Um, so the New Craig region will fall into this area now. We're kind of holding on New Craig. So um, at the EMSRB license, licensing agency, uh, New Craig, the city of New Craig owns the license and primary service area. Uh, North Morrill manages it on the, the license on a daily basis, the operations. Um, and that's our job, to make sure that we're there every day providing coverage for our, our uh, community members. Uh, I just threw this map in there just to show that our, uh, the primary service area of New Craig and the area that we cover up here. For the council's benefit, when you take a look at that, uh, uh, although it seems uh, rather small in, in stature, is that it covers a little over 94,000 square miles, uh, or about 100, excuse me, acres, excuse me, I get ahead of myself. <laughs> 94,000 acres, or 147 square miles. And, uh, so it is, a, it is a large area. Um, so like Pat had mentioned earlier, um, we came in 2009 from volunteer service, uh, volunteer service uh, with BLS service provided. Um, initially it was started with a 12-hour primary ALS and then on the back side of the evening it was an off-premise call ALS uh, crew that was on from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Back in September of uh, 21st of 2017, um, Data was looked at, it was, it was noted that we probably need another truck in and provide 24 hour coverage besides having a, a backup truck, off premise call truck, uh, 24 hours a day as well. Uh, so that was implemented on September 21st, uh, 2017. So we do have 24 hour primary coverage um, and 24 hour off premise coverage. And the requirement is typically they have to be within eight minutes if they're off prem. So if they live outside of the community, they actually have to come in and stay at the base or be within the community so they can get to the base within eight minutes. Um, if their primary truck has to go to a certain distance, they'll call our backup truck in. So they always have a secondary truck waiting. 
Um, this map displays our whole region, uh, the colored areas. Blue Prey is that uh, primary service area. Fairbowl is the primary service, service area, and then we have the Wasika. Fairbowl and Wasika bump up to each other. Uh, we're just not completely continuous with Blue Prey up on top. But we do have two trucks in each region, 24 hours a day, to provide service and to be able to pull resources like needed. <coughs> If New Prey becomes short on trucks because they get extra busy, we can pull trucks from Wasika or, or uh, Fairbowl to help cover New Prey, and vice versa. Um, usually each cost center isn't busy, that busy every single time, so we have enough resources to, to float around, almost like a system status management program where we move trucks if we need to, and we should provide that coverage for that area. Um, this is a, an isochrome map, um, basically it is it shows how far we can get in a certain amount of time. And I just basically did it 30 minutes at speed limit, not speeding by any means, just the basic speed limit. And it just shows some basic overlap how far we can get. Um, if it was a code three, we could actually get further, but I just wanted to, to uh, display the standard driving speed, how far we can get between each region within that time frame. Um, with the new implementation, uh, our response times uh, compared to the last three years. As you can see, we were a little down in 2017. 2018, we did have um, a little uptick, but in 2019, we were really pushing, and we had some new, new team members brought on board, and a lot of them stayed at the base as, um, when they're on op -cram. So we really did help increase our response times with that second trial. Um, as well as for our near facility response time. If you compare to the 2017, 2018, 2019, we have a decrease every single year. So with the new, some new team members staying uh, on, within the building, when they're off-premise, we have that almost 24 hour coverage of two primary trucks, but they're there on off-premise. So it's helped with our response time. Um, and actually, this is 6.78. If you look at the Hamilton County, they're, they're, their requirement is 10 minutes and 59 seconds. So we're beating that quite, quite significantly. Um, yearly volume comparison, we have seen a growth um, year after year. Um, 2016, we took a dip from 15, but as you can see, 2017, 2018, and 2019, it's all been positive growth. Um, looking at the differences between 911 versus transfers, um, we're almost 50 50s, 2017, 2018, 2019, we're seeing an uptick. But that's common. We're starting to see that more and more in each cost center just because um, the fo smaller facilities are trans in, uh, trans transferring their patients to the larger hospitals. Like here, they're sending them to Mankato or Rochester or Abbott. Uh, D1 is sending them to Alina. So the smaller facilities are actually, because they have more resources at the larger hubs, they're sending them there. So we're starting to see an uptick in, in the inner facilities within the, within the cost centers. <coughs> Um, this slide just represents uh, 2019 uh, requests per hour of day. As you can see, right about uh, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, we start seeing an uptick. And then throughout the day, it goes up. And then as we draw into the evening, we see a decrease on the number of requests for service um, in New Prague. Um, this map represents the the number of calls and map all the addresses for requests and services for 2019. Um, the numbers just re represent that bubble. There's that many in that area. Um, the 1225 is New Prague area. A lot of them come from um, just the residents and the hospital because the facility are coming in here as well. Um, you'll see some outliers out there. We do help with mutual aid uh, responses. So like out at Northfield, you'll see three maybe four. Um, we do get requests for mutual aid when they are short, so we will pull a truck over there to the call and then when one are in a facility we have the resources. Um, and vice versa, if we go down the Mankato, like you see 14 in Mankato, if uh, Mankato Hospital is in need and their service can't help them, they'll ask us for mutual aid help and if we have the resources, we'll help them if we're down there already. Um, so we do float around, but we do, like I said, we do move the trucks around from Wasika and if they're we need to recover we pray uh, for what we'll see, or vice versa. We just we'll move them around if we need to. If we have resources, if we don't have the resources. We won't do the mutual aid. Um, our priority is our uh, Patient destinations. 
911, uh, as you can see, uh, New Prague is had a uh, New Prague Hospital had a nice uptick from 2018 to 2019 uh, for destinations uh, for the area, which is good. I've been working with the team to make sure that we do give the option of the of the patient to decide where they want to go as long as within within reason. Um, if they don't have a preferred doctor, my preference is that they go to uh, New Prague Hospital for for evaluation. Um, some do prefer to go to other locations, and like, and like I said, if it's within if they reason, we will take them to that to that receiving hospital. Um, we do use um, our medical direction above. If it comes into question, if it seems kind of far, we'll call medical direction. Like we did have a couple that went down to Mankato, but those are typically medical directions contacted. They may have been discharged that day or the day before, and they want to go back down there because they've been discharged. Let's just go back down there and continue my care instead of going here, and they don't want to go back down there. So. We typically do contact medical control for those decisions when it's farther away. Transport uh, patient destinations. Um, number one is Mankato. So New Prague is sending most of their patients to Mankato. Second, they're going to North uh, Abbott. And then third, uh, Rochester. We do have other facilities, but those are minimal. They might be uh, mental health transfers and we go to Fargo, more uh, Steve River Falls, you know, it could just be a medical transfer to Metro to a hospital to go to the new train, but they're, so let's fall into the other. Um, questions? There's a lot of information in the short amount of time, but. There was one chart I thought I had a question. Okay. Now I have to find it. It was a bar chart, so it should be pretty. Okay, so volume comparison. Volume of what? Is that? Which one, yeah. This is year to year. So, how many transports we did year okay. to year? So, 20, back in 2010, we did 475 transports um, to some destination, either here or maybe a transfer. Um, in 2019, we did 1,309. Uh, we did actually did 1,700 and. 39 requests for service last year, uh, but we transported 1,300 <coughs> And some of those that were transported were either canceled, some of those calls are canceled, or did we get there and the patient decides they don't want to go. So those are the other 400 that were transported. We're seeing trend, trends like this elsewhere too, and part of it is the age in America. Uh, folks uh, are getting older, they're getting naturally sicker. So um, that's an impact, and then certainly growth in the area, just in general, in terms of housing and so forth, also has an impact. So um, it's not unusual to see, to see this. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I have just one note. Are we going to take action tonight, or are we going to wait till uh, next week and get a review of the mail order? What, what, in my material is to you that, uh, as I indicate, that uh, you can see uh, North Memorial Health has provided both the uh, service uh, agreement, contract for services, and the building lease. As part of my uh, information to you tonight is that uh, we've uh, received an inquiry from uh, uh, Mayo Hospital that uh, they'd like to come in and talk to the council and uh, so with the hospital administrator we've scheduled them to come in and uh, do a presentation to the council on uh, january 21st so in you know likelihood uh, that as we're bringing this here tonight uh, the current one doesn't expire till april 30th so you have time to take action and uh, again we try to do it to get it done while pat was still here uh, before he officially retires next week uh, so I didn't start with somebody else, and so yes, the council could choose to move forward with it. Uh, if you thought that there was reason to uh, the table, it, you could do that. You could elect to modify the agreements if you feel you needed to do that, or you could choose to not enter into the agreements. But 
based on the inquiry that we received from uh, Mayo Hospital, uh, they'd like to come in and uh, make a presentation to you in two weeks. And so on that basis, I'd probably recommend that uh, even though this is ready to go from our end of things and from a North Memorial standpoint, is I'd recommend that we uh, at least listen to uh, uh, Mayo Hospital and see what they have to say uh, in, in two weeks uh, before you ultimately then take action on this. So you wouldn't necessarily need a motion to table. Um, we could just schedule it in, in for next week review or? Because we can table it. I just, um, if we don't have to, we don't have to. Well, no, that uh, in, in, in light of the fact that uh, overtures have been made by uh, Mayo Hospital, uh, with them being our, our local uh, hospital, uh, or also a clinic, is that I think it would be uh, probably prudent to listen to what they have to uh, uh, make available. I've not seen any of the materials, and I don't have any of that from the, the hospital as of today. Uh, but would expect that uh, probably the week before the, the meeting. And so while this is technically ready to go and could be acted upon, uh, I'd probably recommend uh, uh, that uh, you at least go through and table it and uh, hear what uh, the Mineral uh, Hospital has uh, to offer and to, and to tell you that uh, I think uh, Councilmember Wolf uh, sits on the, the Mayo Community Board and has been involved with uh, the Mayo Hospital system as far as what it has done, uh, improvements in direction in the community. And so I think as a courtesy and with them being the, the type of player they are in the community, I think it's worth, uh, you know, uh, taking a look and uh, listening and seeing what, mm -hmm. uh, what they might have to provide to us in a couple of weeks. Yeah, because uh, I'm aware that Mayo Clinic isn't really prepared to do anything, but you know, it's the likelihood of this taking action on this is very good, um, but um, I'll, I'll make the motion to table it until next week, or until the next meeting, um, um, so that we can hear the presentation uh, from uh, North, or from, North, or, uh, from uh, 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 Mayo. Uh, I, I guess if you were going to make that motion, uh, Councilman Seiler, that, uh, you know, I, I, I would table it until after you've heard that presentation. I don't know that, uh, I would schedule this necessarily back on that meeting. So it could be into the first part of February before, uh, you know, again, uh, listening to what they have to say on the 21st, uh, you then would be in, uh, in a position to begin having debate probably at the first meeting in February as to where you think you might want to go and whether you're in a position to, to take the action. But as it stands tonight, these documents are ready from North Memorial's perspective. They're ready to go. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, um, I'll make the motion to table this for 30 days or until uh, the first to, meeting in February. Do we need to make a motion on that, Mike? Or? Well, you could choose to take no action uh, tonight with the understanding that, uh, you know, you, you can either formally do that or informally do that. that uh, you know, if you don't have a motion that comes forward to necessarily approve it, then really you're, you're, you're taking action to table it. And if North, or excuse me, if Mayo Hospital is going to come in on January 21st, uh, likely you wouldn't look at it until your first meeting in February. So I don't know. I don't know. You want me to withdraw my motion? Yeah, right now. Okay. And I don't withdraw. think they're done with their. We haven't heard from Lisa. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> so. Well, thank you. Mayor, council personnel, um, I just, I'm here tonight just to let you know that I've been in this community for 20 years. I'm still considered a transplant, I'm an original New Prager. Um, I started with New Prague Ambulance and I was with them as volunteer service, BLS service for eight years. Um, did wonderful things for the community. Um, there still has that bond, we still have that group, and we still do things within the community like AEDs and the Breakfast with Santa. North Memorial came in in 2010, and we've upgraded our commitment to the community and our services to the community. Um, we still have that, that level of care that uh, volunteer service had, but we've stepped it up. 
we can now, instead of taking as a volunteer service, bring you to a hospital, now as North Memorial, we can come on in and we can take care of you right then and there and bring you where you need to go. Um, be it here in town, be it to another hospital, we're here for the community and we want to stay here for the community. We don't want to have to leave um, if you choose not to have a stay here. Um, so be it, but we're here for the community. When it boils down to it, um, I'm out there every day. I'm not here making money as to the point where I'm going to get rich. Um, I'm here for us in our area that we live. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a, comes close to home when I can come up to somebody and I know them and I can take care of them on one of their worst days that they're having. And the comfort that they have knowing that somebody walks into their home or their business and they know that person, and they can take care, know that they're going to get the best health care they can. North Memorial trains us. Um, we have the, we're at the forerunner of, of our equipment, of our training, um, of emergency medicine in general. And we've got the backing of the hospital. We work great with the hospital. I love those people in the ER, the staff there. We work great with all the volunteer firemen in town, and as well as the police officers. So I would just hope you would consider um, taking us on for another five years, maybe ten continue it as long as you'd like. Uh, but to know that we're here for the community, we have always been here for the community, and we'll continue to be here for the community, even if you don't choose us, I would hope that you would please take that into consideration. So, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Would you, would you like to be a 20 year contract? <laughs> I certainly would, yes sir, I would. A 20 year contract would be good if you care to vote on that right now. <laughs> Hinder that at all. <laughs> How did that transition go? I, I wasn't. Would, I would be totally honest with you. When we went from a transition from a volunteer to an ALS service, um, I was in those meetings. I was here when Pat was here. Um, it did not go smoothly. It did not. Um, it was rough. And as a volunteer service, to think somebody can come in here and do a better job than what we were doing, that hurt. But we soon came to realize that as North came in, they took us all in. There's still five of us that were on that volunteer service that still work with North Memorial today. And we realized that they didn't come in to take that away from us, they came in and made us better. So we are now better. And uh, providing the care that we provide now, I just, I can't imagine that it uh, didn't go any further. I, it's just fantastic, so. Appreciate your honesty. Yeah, that's good story. Yeah. Well, you guys do a great job. Good luck on your retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention that, uh, as Mike said, I'm on the advisory group, the committee group of male health, and uh, so just that's transparent. But I would like to uh, thank you and uh, thank North Memorial and congratulate them on the service that they provide to the It's obvious that the standard of service, um, their service increased quite a bit since they came, as you mentioned, from volunteer. And many of us had good friends that were involved in the ambulance as a volunteer. And it was required to bring up the service and the service increased to our citizens and pray because of what they did. So, and it is, um, and my family's had experience with me to use the ambulance so I can attest to the confidence and the comfort that they provide, especially if you've seen a face like Lisa's that you're familiar with. I want to make those comments and thank you for what you've done for new grade for the last year. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, I think uh, based on I think the comments of the council, I think we'd like to listen to a uh, presentation by mail on the 21st and maybe take action on that after with that be either uh, the first week in February since we do have some time. Is that all right with the council? That's fine. That's all right. Right. I think uh, I'd like to see if we get a cost comparison of similar runs and how that might play out. I think that's an important uh, question to ask for the residents. I mean, some it's more expensive than the other. What, for example, would Mayo charge a resident going up to Abbott versus uh, North? You know, if we could do light comparisons. Well, I don't even know at this point that uh, we're going to hear that Mayo's in a position to even provide service immediately. No, so but if they do, I think that I, would. 
I don't, I don't know that because I don't know exactly what's coming <coughs> in the presentation, and so it's it's difficult to get that answer and provide that at this point. And I think we need to hear uh, that presentation before I try to answer any of those questions. I, I agree. Right. What I was saying though is I think the next step instead of just approving that next week or at the next meeting after that presentation, I'd like to see a comparison of the cost. So a question as, as an ambulance this, service, do you contract with different networks um, so, and, um, and capitation payments or anything of that nature? Yeah, so this gets into a really muddy area. Yeah. yeah. I'm more than happy to so share that's why it makes it difficult. that would help you know, get you comfortable, but in terms of making comparisons and healthcare uh, pricing, as you well know, you see it in, in the in national news and so forth, it gets pretty uh, mushy. Uh, we contract with all of the, the major uh, health plans, so um, we don't do any balance uh, billing that's not associated with the contract that we would have with be it the Blues or Humana or whomever. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, where it, it uh, uh, costs or prices, if you will, that get charged are often irrelevant to what gets paid. Um, we are all, as providers, about 70 roughly about 70%, maybe not quite 70% of the patients that we take care of are, are on, now on a government program, be it either Medicare or Medicaid. And so if we charge $1,200, it doesn't matter what we charge because they've got a fee schedule that they pay everybody the same thing. So that's where it gets... Uh, that's for the very strange and it's hard to compare because you could talk well they have a they might have a blues contract that um, has generous discounts well they may have a, uh, a different contract with a health partner or somebody that uh, is perhaps better than what we get with the blues or um, so if you take a look at your insurance for instance your medical insurance it will tell you what your out-of-pocket is for that service, but then because they're contracted, let's say, with your insurance company, there's an agreed upon amount of money that they will get for that particular transfer or that particular run. So you can't compare them side by side because the Mayo Clinic Health System is also has a contract with those major healthcare providers, and they're going to contract what they want as reimbursement except for federal and state programs which have a flat uh, reimbursement rate. And I only know this because I'm in the business, so. Yeah, exactly. So you, you can't just say if North, North Memorial charges $1,200 for a run and Mayo Clinic Health Systems charge $800 for the run, in the end what they get paid and what the patient has to pay is clearly between the insurance companies. Right, I understand that. But I just still think as, as one that ultimately the, the ends up paying a certain percentage. Uh, let's just use our own city employees. You know, if Mayo's twelve hundred dollars and you're eight hundred dollars, eventually somehow that four hundred dollars difference, whether they pay it or not, they still might pay two hundred dollars max for both of them for their ride at their proportion of it. But still, it adds to the cost of our overall plan. And when we go to sign up each year for that. So there must be some base well, if fees. You, if you wanted a, a, a fair comparison, um, what we need is a scenario. Like you want to see That's what I was saying. A, a, a blues patient or a health partner's patient or something like that. And you'd, be, you'd have to say for a ride from here to there, a level of care of advanced life support emergency or VLS emergency, whatever one you would pick, and put those side by side, we can tell you what we would expect to get reimbursed based out off of the um, <coughs> contract. Right. <coughs> so no flashy blue light specials. Very not. <laughs> it's complex. It's, uh, That's an ambulance. It's frustrating <laughs> for, for us. It's frustrating for people receiving care. Hopefully, you know, we, <coughs> there are efforts underway to try to get to more trace price transparency um, over time hopefully people will get there okay thank you any other questions well, I just want to say uh, 
I got to know Pat. The last uh, 10 years since I've been mayor, and uh, they've always uh, been, Pat's done a great job, a great service for Attorney Craig, and uh, he's getting me missed. So, uh, I miss you again. You know, we, got, we, we booted Dave Augustine okay. out of there, and, and, and now we're booting Pat out. So it's, it's a lot of the old guard is leaving, but uh, I hope you enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Okay, so again, <coughs> the consensus is we will hear the program that Mail has at the 21st, and we will uh, move forward after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, so. Okay. okay. Six. Ken, are you going to take this? Or Mike? Good. As we do every year, we have our um, annual fee schedule review. And we are looking tonight for um, this to be adopted with the <coughs> fees that are proposed <coughs> on the fee schedule that is in front of you tonight. Um, we would do this by resolution, which is also included in your packet. We just wanted to run through the fees with uh, council tonight. Just take a look at the fee schedule listing. I have the uh, current fees, which are listed in the middle column, and then any proposed 2020 fee is in the far right column and highlighted in the middle. Do we have any change? Yep. As you discuss that, would you mind just letting us know which ones we really uh, charge a lot? I'm feeling some of these fees we hardly ever charge. Oh, yeah. So if you give some feel for myself, a feel for which ones really matter. <laughs> <laughs> some of them might be able to comment on this. Bruce is involved in it really bad. I'll defer to, to Glenn, Bruce, or Jim on, on a few of these, but um, I guess we'll start right off the top uh, with the nuisance abatement uh, assessment charge and administrative charge. And I'll, this is a topic that came up when we had our uh, mowing and uh, utility account fee um, hearing back in uh, October. And uh, more specifically, it came up with the mowing charges and other property maintenance charges that we had and trying to continue to ratchet these fees up in order to um, make it a little less palatable for companies to, or uh, property owners to just sit back and say, I uh, take care of it and uh, have staff worry about sending out the mowing company every few weeks and then um, ultimately having to send out notices and then um, ultimately assess the property. So we're proposing a $25 increase on uh, the per lot per incident. Anytime we have somebody go out to a lot, sort of $75 or 15%. And we added that or 15% for the larger um, development um, cleanups that we've had to do in the past. And then uh, anytime a property is assessed, we want to make sure that we're uh, covering our staff time to track down the legal descriptions, write up the notices and that uh, uh, type of activity. So we feel that is uh, hopefully going to help uh, deter people from continuing to just let this go on the taxes. So um, this the highlighted is your... Uh, um, highlighted in yellow, that's what we're proposing. Those are the already added. So the that's, that's what we're proposing. Okay. Yep. So we do run into those a number of times every year, Bruce. So the service charge is defined as whatever work you had to go out and hire someone to do staff uh, time remediation. Yeah. Yep, that's on top of or poison, yeah. poison or whatever. Yep, that's on top of whatever the contractor. So 15 percent of the bill from the lawn mowing company. Correct. Okay. Yep. So that uh, we feel is a good change uh, for those items. Um, there's no more questions on those. I can move on to the subordination of small cities development program agreements. We would do maybe um, three to five of these a year. Um, there's not a load of review time. We have a template from the city attorney. It's just basically, uh, uh, at this point, my time to uh, fill in the blanks, pull up some legal descriptions, and, and get those in front of the council. So uh, just trying to cover the staff time that we have into those. So not too many a year. Um, moving on to public works, and, uh, again, I'll defer to Glenn if we have any uh, things here. But these are uh, a couple of changes for wanting to make sure that we're charging actual costs for blacktop and gravel, and then just a slight $10 an hour increase for uh, labor during normal uh, work hours here. 
And then um, also related to public works fees, we have an equipment rate. Uh, we just want to uh, basically know that we just want to have actual labor costs uh, attached to the equipment rate. Um, it was just a slight change. Glad I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. No, nope, you covered it all. Unless somebody's got a question. Under what circumstances would we ever rent out our equipment? It usually will pertain to uh, um, uh, accident on the road. Something happened that they need somebody out there to uh, take care of a problem. Uh, so it don't happen often. Uh, we've had situations where a contractor has been working on something, ran into uh, a huge problem, and asked us for help. Well, there's where the charges come from. Okay, so it's um, not an individual community member asking for the easier No, right? no. It's, it's an emergency. It's something that we feel even if it's a contractor coming to us asking, uh, uh, can you come out with your jet back and clean this up for me? It's because it will affect a resident or residents if we don't help them right now. Thank you. Okay, we'll move along to the next page. We have premises extension permit. This is a fee that we are proposing to be added that had not been listed previously before. This is to uh, cover staff time for getting these uh, temporary um, extension um, for alcohol to be served on temporary patios. Uh, I've seen we had a number of those last year and uh, really weren't collecting anything for those. So I'm um, suggesting a fee of $100, which would be uh, similar to a temporary on sale uh, intoxicating or non-intoxicating license. So we feel the same amount of work goes into both uh, these types of uh, things. So we wanted to add that on fee schedules. Can you give me an example of that? What are you talking about? Is that for like those ink years? Uh, a good example was the um, checkers. Checkers. checkers event that they had in the back of their building in the parking lot. And you want to charge $100 for um, administrative fee? Yep, because we have a lot of staff time to review, make sure we get the site plan, uh, track down their insurance certificate to make sure they're covering that right. extended area. Yep. Okay. Not a huge fee, but just cover our time. And that's the same fee that we charge for people who want temporary licenses. Right? Same dollar amount, $100. Yes. Next fee uh, under planning and zoning. Uh, we've had a few more registered land surveys in the past. These are uh, reviews of uh, similar nature to a plant, but we do have to uh, hold a public hearing and bring those in front of the Planning Commission and Council. We didn't have a fee listed specifically, um, and we want to make sure we have a fee added. We have been using the uh, final plat fee. Uh, it's actually a little more work that goes into the RLS than a uh, final plat, but not as much as a preliminary plat, so the $500 fee uh, lies right between these. We've maybe had one or two a year in the past few years at least, so let's make sure, that, again, we're covering staff time and covering our notices that we need to issue for the registered land survey review. Uh, getting into park facility rental fees, we have a fee we're proposing to be added, and this is uh, for the daily use of Memorial Park baseball field. This is different than the tournament fee that was already on the schedule, where you have Obviously, a number of teams and a number of activities uh, coming and going during the day. This is just the daily use. It does not include, as it does not include for any other uh, softball or baseball field dues, uh, dragging of the, the fields, and that's where the fee is less than the tournament fee. Um, we're proposing $80 for that uh, daily use fee of, of that field. Again, to cover uh, in garbage collection and that type of thing. Uh, obviously, we go out there after the use of all these facilities and make sure that they haven't been vandalized or abused in any way. Um, moving down to police service charges, uh, Chief Garris is uh, recommending a uh, police officer with vehicle and without vehicle, just raise those both by uh, $10 an hour. I don't know how many years ago we had last changed that, Jim. It's been a while. Probably. So, yeah, eat the 10. Again, just so what, what, what's the change now? I mean, with a vehicle, it's um, um, the 75 or 75 an hour. It is, you know, with, a vehicle, with the vehicle, it's currently 85. Proposed to go to 95. Right. And without a vehicle. And then without it was 10 dollars less. Than that. Okay. Because we don't have reserve fees, right? We do not right now. Yeah. Moving on from. Is that for a private event? Is that what that charge is for? Or what, what are we doing? Um, yeah, like uh, any of our tank escorts for chart, for Hans and Meyer hauling, when we escort a tank, 
then those would be the numbers that we utilize for that. Or if we do security at Earl's Hotel for a wedding, that's what they end up getting charged per hour for that officer to be there. Is $95 an hour covering our expense and something like that? That seems yes. to be low. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the, the squad car gets somebody there and the, for that type of detail, you're not really utilizing the squad car for seven, eight hours. Uh, but like on a, on a tank escort, it is $95 an hour for that officer and the car, but then they also charge any other costs of fuel or anything else gets charged out also. So that uh, staff person then, is that part of their 40 hour um, depending on what the scheduling or what happens, but generally they're on overtime, and that's why the cost is at that $85 or $95 because it's time and a half, and then all of the other costs that go with it. But uh, still, appears low to me. But it does cover the cost for everybody that gets paid for those assignments or for that. Depreciation of the vehicle. Yep. $60,000 vehicle. Yeah, $10 difference is that what you're on? Okay, we can move on. Uh, remainder of the fees are going to be related to utility billing, uh, starting with water, uh, or just changes fees there. Uh, new fee added for Minnesota Department of Health water connection fee, 81 cents a month. That was not previously listed on the fee schedule. Uh, increase in the base rate for the storm sewer rate, and then for electric, uh, other uh, added fees on there. And to note, uh, specifically for the electric, a couple of new fees for uh, charging their bucket and digger truck. $120 an hour, not previously listed in the fee schedule, and then the service truck at $55 an hour. And then uh, they plan to use the labor rate, um, similar to um, public works for the actual employee labor, in addition to those uh, equipment uh, rates, should that be needed. Um, skid loader, backhoe, trencher, and other uh, direction boring equipment are also listed um, on here as well that were not previously listed. So all these new utilities fees, uh, have been approved by the commission? Yes. And what's the, the uh, Department of Health water service connection fee? Can you explain that just a little bit? Bruce, I'll, I'll explain I'll that. I'll take that. So for, for every service that we have out there, we have to give the Department of Health a fee every, every month. And so we have to charge that and then reimburse the state for it every year. And um, it, it went from, I believe, don't hold me to it exactly, Sean, about it just about doubled this past year. And they, I, I think they haven't had a rate increase for about 10 years, but then they really doubled it this past year. So we have to pass that fee along to every customer. Okay. So we had been charging it. it just Yeah, we had been charging it, just that there was an increase, so we noted that. Is that a line item on the bill? I don't recall seeing it, but I- I believe it is. Because I- Yeah. And automatic. Yeah. So I don't really see it. And the final uh, item to note is the interest rate for uh, customer deposits of water and electric um, by statute was decreased uh, down to 1.5%. So that's what we have proposed. Um, so if you have any other questions, uh, we can try to cover those for you. If not, we look for the resolution to be approved to adopt the fee schedule would be effective um, as of uh, its approval tonight. But we can always amend it, I should at any point throughout the year. So can I assume that uh, under the park <coughs> facilities that includes the rate increases that our park board discussed? Excuse me? The park board discussed some rate increases for the use of um, some of the fields, right? We did last year. Okay, so this, this reflects those new this does not reflect any additional fees other than we had adopted would have been, boy, don't pin me to a date, I think sometime in March or April, 
Okay. Was the last time we addressed that? We'll be looking at it at that again, Maggie. Okay. This spring. Please. All right. Because we did discuss about raising some of the fees, just because. We wanted to wait for a full year, so okay. yes, we're not doing yeah. those at this time. Because what we're charging doesn't cover our, our costs by a large right. amount. <laughs> yep. So. Okay. Anyone else has any questions on the, the new fee schedule? If not, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the 2020 official city fee schedule. Second. Second by Rick Seiler. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, pass this 5 0. Can that survey or that um, calculation that you can send in regarding development fees at city charges, mm -hmm. is that in January or when does that get sent? Uh, I'm not sure if we've been notified that that uh, has been something we've working on. I think typically January. I'll check with Devin. Now we're working on all of our end of the year reporting right now for uh, permit stats for the prior year. So okay. usually I'll get that from her and uh, go over that with her, but I have not seen that yet. Okay. So but we can know, definitely pass that along. I still feel comfortable or okay with the balance of the right. Correct. So. Okay. Thank you. Ken, are you taking the uh, I am. judges? So new in 2020, and it has been done in the uh, past, I think they mentioned in their uh, election court training, it's been a number of years, but uh, there is a presidential nomination primary occurring on March 3rd. Uh, we are required by resolution to appoint election judges and set the pay. Um, actually, uh, a little bit under the gun for timing on this. Uh, a couple of things come into play here. So. We are unable to appoint brand new judges for the presidential nomination primary. We have to use judges that already have gone through two hours of training uh, during the 2018 election cycle. Uh, so we had a limited pool to select from and we were able to um, obtain uh, 19 interested judges that are able to serve on the presidential primary day and attend an additional uh, training session for the presidential nomination primary. Uh, we do believe that would be adequate uh, for um, the amount of people we expect to come in and vote at the presidential nomination primary. That would be uh, happening uh, at the Parish Activity Center at St. Juan's, which is our normal location for uh, elections. A um, couple other things to note, there will be two ballots, uh, one for Democratic Party and one for the Republican Party. Those will be the only two ballots. Uh, Residents have to declare which ballot, uh, which party they would like, and um, if they don't do that, they won't be allowed to uh, vote in that presidential nomination primary. So, I'm not quite sure how that'll uh, work on the day of election. Uh, I've gone through uh, some training uh, at a staff level at this point, but um, it'll be interesting nonetheless. And especially when they throw which county that they <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, so with that, um, setting the, the pay, I think we'd like to stick with this pay for uh, the judges throughout uh, 2020 here, but we're proposing uh, 1096 an hour, um, minimum wage is $10 an hour. We had paid at the last cycle uh, 1050 an hour, and um, the wage that we're proposing is actually the same as uh, part-time uh, winter help um, staff that we have, so I thought that was a good number to, to be consistent with that. And um, I just got one quick question yeah. for you, Ken. Um, um, is um, does this include then the general, or are we going to have to do this? We have to, we'll have to come back and reappoint. We'll have to have a larger pool that we'll re-advertise for for the mm -hmm. primary um, election in August, and then the general in November. So and this they got to get recertified then. Yep, there will be brand new training for everybody. At that so you point. might want to get that to us soon. What's that? You might want to get it to us soon. Uh, we usually won't do that until. Uh, Probably after the primary. Well, it'll be definitely be after this. There's only so many days in advance. You typically want to do that. Uh, we'll advertise in our newsletter and on the website and things like that. I think uh, June is probably the time frame we'll be looking to do that. Training occurs in July every year. Uh, comments put those in. Do we pay anything for using the uh, PAC? Uh, I don't recall the first year we did not. I think we might have had a minimum fee of maybe $100 or 150 per event for this last one, okay. which is more than reasonable um, considering uh, their lack of use for that day, actually day and a half. Um, 
we have to set up the day prior. I, I'll verify that for you, but it's minimal if there is any. Okay. No. Any other questions? I guess I'm ignorant of that. This piece for all those costs, the, uh, the good question. So with the presidential nomination primary, we actually um, have the state providing the funding for uh, this presidential nomination primary. That was built into the state law. Um, so we actually have to track our costs. We will re uh, send in a reimbursement form to the Secretary of State, and then we will be reimbursed for those costs uh, for the primary in August and the one in uh, general in November. That is our cost, and we have budgeted for that. Um, fully within our 2020 budget. This presidential nomination primary is the only one that's reimbursable. Okay. Kind of an unusual quirk of that. Okay. Any other questions? I guess I'll look for a motion to approve the election judge for the primary. So moved. And a motion by Maggie Bass. Second. Second by Sean Ryan. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Thanks, Ken. Mike, are you going to take this next one? Yeah, that uh, I, I certainly will. That uh, I've kind of taken this away from Patty, uh, who was on vacation this week, but. Uh, uh, she is coordinated with uh, all of the department heads. Uh, uh, we've been working on since last April when the council identified that uh, one of the items that we had uh, come out of our April uh, workshop last year was to uh, take a look at reviewing and updating the uh, city's personnel policy. We enlisted uh, help from Leah Davis, uh, CPA and president of AEM Workforce Solutions Partner which is a subsidiary of our auditors, Abdo, Ike, and Myers, uh, in July of this year to help with uh, reviewing and uh, <coughs> updating our uh, existing handbook. Although Patty doesn't say it, our existing handbook uh, was uh, first written and uh, put together and implemented, uh, I believe, uh, a little over 22 years ago. So it uh, was long overdue for, uh, for an update. and so. As we worked, the intent and the outcome was to consolidate and uh, update the contents of the existing handbook and also to ensure that uh, the new regulatory policies that weren't contained in the handbook uh, and were uh, required uh, either under the state statutes or otherwise, that we were able to uh, integrate those uh, into that. So we've worked extensively uh, over uh, the last six months to. Uh, to try to update and revisit and have discussion uh, on all the various uh, elements contained within the uh, draft personnel policy that you have in front of you tonight. We also spent the latter part of December having uh, the attorneys Bob Alsop and Scott Riggs out of the city attorney's office uh, review and uh, make changes and modifications uh, where they uh, saw needed and so what we've attempted to uh, attach is, uh, um, albeit uh, five pages, uh, a short summary uh, attempting to outline uh, the modifications or changes that have occurred uh, within the scope of the uh, personnel policy or handbook, uh, trying to indicate uh, whether uh, it's something new was added or whether it's a rewrite or or just what was happening uh, uh, we tried to put together as best we could uh, that summary that we have attached uh, for your review um, additionally in taking a look at it uh, i asked patty as part of the, the preparation of the materials uh, was to identify any of the uh, substantive changes uh, to the to the policy uh, that affected uh, any uh, any items uh, that were generally seen as type uh, as, as benefit type items uh, so she's got included in the memo that you have in front of you from uh, her and the staff and I is that uh, one of the things under the health insurance that now that we are up to 50 employees 
uh, we uh, needed to, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, was to take a look at that we now have to offer to uh, employees that uh, work uh, on average 30 hours a week uh, health insurance. Um, doesn't mean that they're going to take it or whatnot, it would be on a pro rata basis, but uh, we have to offer that now, whereas before we were under 50 employees, and so we didn't uh, have to do that. Uh, the only one that we have that I think comes into uh, uh, potential more so in the summer and uh, at this point isn't hitting year round is a uh, uh, day or part time employee over at the golf course. So, other than that, we haven't had uh, any others that kind of come into play. <coughs> On the, on the holiday, one is just uh, the proposed uh, change uh, of a half a day on uh, Good Friday and moving that to uh, end up with a proposed full day uh, on Christmas Eve. Uh, there are uh, options if an employee uh, needs time off for uh, religious uh, options that uh, either vacation, uh, uh, or a floating holiday are options, so there are choices if we make that move, and the council would concur with that, uh, that uh, there still is capabilities for employees to take time off. Um, one of the uh, ones that uh, obviously there, there's really not been any major change in, uh, it has to do with uh, the vacation area, and, and in that area, it's noted that back in uh, October of 2010, uh, we went to, we changed uh, how employees received uh, uh, vacation and went to uh, laying that out on an accrual system. So any employee hired since October of 2010 uh, has uh, received uh, vacation and it's accrued uh, in conjunction uh, with payrolls versus receiving a lump sum to begin uh, the uh, calendar year or on their uh, anniversary date. As well with that and in reviewing that with uh, Leah Davis uh, that we also talked about one of the uh, up and coming items that uh, as we take a look at uh, as everybody is right now trying to uh, recruit employees and hold on to employees is to take a look at since there hasn't been any change in this area for over 20 years is a slight change uh, as you take a look at uh, the offering uh, on vacation under the uh, proposed uh, accrual and we've got that set up over 26 payrolls whereas previously the accrual was done over 24 payrolls uh, and then the, the 25th and 26th was, uh, was skipped as we just tried from an accounting standpoint to tie it into uh, our existing payroll system. And so you can see there's some slightly, uh, uh, some slight increases when you uh, make the comparison in there, uh, trying to update uh, in the uh, initial hiring area as well as uh, in the, uh, the middle areas and a little bit on the back end for those employees that uh, have been here uh, 20 years or more. So uh, I don't believe it's necessarily significant, but it is a change and we felt it prudent and appropriate to at least point out and to uh, uh, indulge the council with at least understanding that we just didn't uh, put it in the vacation schedule and uh, not bring it to your uh, direct attention. Then in the next one, under the uh, severance provision that uh, is noted in the, in the summary as well, is that uh, there was a, a benefit there uh, let me try to make sure I get to the right language to uh, explain that. It was kind of a technical language that uh, was under severance is that upon retirement, termination by the city or abolishment of the position, uh, the city uh, had a severance uh, package that was made available. And in most cases, uh, this typically would just come into play when we had employees uh, retiring and in there is, is that it provides for the payment of unused sick leave in an amount of up to uh, 12 weeks uh, based on what they had accrued. Um, in many cases, most employees are taking that and putting that into uh, a health savings account uh, or a well to viva account is where that uh, had gone. And then there was a payment by the city of an amount equivalent to up to six months 
of the city's standard contribution. We're only paid for employees' benefits for uh, single health, dental, uh, and life. And in there is that uh, those were offered uh, uh, where the language said that the city shall provide these, and then it had language in there is that uh, the above offering was uh, uh, offered at the discretion of the council. And so we're trying to modify and improve the language and uh, as part of that make a change so that in uh, moving the uh, severance piece relative to the payment of the sick leave, that that would be added to under the sick leave policy uh, provision um, in a similar fashion as to uh, what's provided there. But then on the, uh, on the other one, uh, we're taking a look at it, there was a question internally as we take a look at cost and should that be provided is that we try to uh, take a look at uh, in improving that and that that, that would only be provided uh, right now for, employ for employees that were hired before January 1 of 2020. So it would be discontinuing that for any new employees hired after January 1 of this year, but that it would be provided uh, only upon separation uh, for employees with at least 20 years of service or that are PERA retirement eligible and provide the normal two weeks of notice. So it was a clarification that right now I just said upon retirement. Well, as we went through and talked about that and looked at that is that kind of a broad area for the most part that uh, uh, it could have been interpreted, but in most cases, when it came to the council, most of the employees that you provided this benefit to all were 20 plus year employees that received that benefit. So if somebody leaves employment at three years, five years, 10 years, they don't get paid for any of that unused uh, sick leave uh, that would be triggered by this benefit. So in it, uh, as I said, uh, we move to provide that, that uh, it would be voluntary separation uh, from the city with at least 20 years of service trying to, uh, trying to cap that or PR retirement eligible. Could you define that, Mike? Pardon? Or could you define PERA? Well, it, it, it varies, uh, and, and that's why we had to be so broad, because we didn't want to try to get into each and every situation. Uh, in, in the case of uh, the police department, um, full retirement uh, in, uh, in the police world uh, under PR in the state of Minnesota, full retirement, Jim, is 55, isn't that? Yes. Is, is 55, where I think uh, in, uh, in our case for non-union employees, uh, I believe it's 59 and a half. Um, and, and so from the standpoint, if they're able to, to meet that and they've got, well, e either 20 years of service or age 59 and a half or 55 in PD, um, and not knowing whether those can change, the PERA one with police changed, uh, I think it was about five years ago, uh, uh, when at that time uh, retirement uh, by police officers could have been at age 50. They, they moved that up now to 55, but it, it, five years ago it was age 50. So that's why in trying to, uh, wanted to put basically PRA retirement eligible. So you could have an employee that's been here three years and they become PERA uh, retirement eligible and then they would be able to qualify for this benefit. Yes, so but, like the time they but it, would only be a, it would only be a pro rata amount of unused sick leave up to, uh, you know, they, they likely wouldn't have a whole lot of sick leave that would be accrued in that three years. Right, but the example could be 10 years as an example. Whatever, pick a number. It, uh, it, it, it's not the age of, um, it's not the years of service that defines it, but it's when they become old enough to qualify for a PE, right? No matter when they started work. Correct. That that would be under the PERA retirement eligible. That uh, you know we, we typically don't hire too many older employees that would come into play. I think with the yeah, let's not say that. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you understand, understand what I'm saying. Right, is yeah. that uh, typically you, you we're not traditionally hiring employees in the <coughs> 50 to 55 plus year age range for most of the positions that we typically employ. And so the, the intent in providing that, or at least as we saw that, is that 
it was upon retirement. So we tried to look at how can we better define that versus just leaving it extremely broad uh, uh, in that sense that it hasn't come into play, at least in the 11 years I've been here, for anybody that has re been eligible to receive this benefit and has been granted the benefit by the council is they have all been employees that have had 20 plus years or more of service to the city. And so that's why we went out on a limb to try to use that language that uh, upon voluntary separation with at least 20 years of service or PER retirement eligible was, was the best that we could come up with. Whereas before it was upon retirement, termination by city or abolishment of a position. So we tried to look at that retirement scenario in, in being able to do that and in taking a look at that, it still has to be that over the, the lifetime that, uh, that they're here, uh, depending upon uh, how much sick leave they've accumulated or what they've used, is that uh, there is a cap on the amount of the benefit. We didn't change that for what was in place, and so there was no change that way, uh, but simply tried to, in light of how it's been provided or approved by the council, and then going a step further trying to, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, somebody that uh, uh, maybe did have uh, uh, other uh, PRA service in another city or was uh, older, uh, that if they were PRA retirement eligible, that, that would allow them, along with uh, two weeks notice, to be able to receive that. But, uh, I can't give you an example in, in the last 11 years. No, I'm just trying to understand it, but I think, uh, and the, if I'm on the same paragraph as you are, in the following paragraph, you have the uh, comma and the word or. In this paragraph, you don't, and it just seems to be more clear that you don't have to meet both standards. You just uh, need to meet the, one or the other. Are you in the summary? Right, upon voluntary separation of the city, at least 20 years of service, comma, para retirement eligible. In the following paragraph, you, you have comma or para. So you don't, it, it's clear in the second paragraph, you don't have to have the 20 years of service. On the first one, it's not as clear. You're on page three, Bruce? Yes. Yeah. The, the word or technically should be in there. Yeah, and I was on the hard copy, and it's, it's that same. It's it, missing on the one paragraph. It, it's I think it makes it more clear. It, it's supposed to be or. Put the or in there so people know that, or, or council on anyone. It, it wasn't intentional. That is, you can imagine we've been through a number of iterations of review, but uh, uh, it, it's good that we always have additional sets of eyes. But no, it was with, it was intent <coughs> upon voluntary separation with at least 20 years of service, comma, or PR retirement eligible and two weeks of prior notice, employees will be paid up to uh, the 480 hours of food sick leave, but it would be based on what they have, but that would be the max or the cap out. Right. right. And then just to make sure I understood what, you, what I thought you said is that with this change, this severance no longer becomes discretionary at the, for the council becomes part of the actual the council has granted all of those that have come up with the, it was actually mixed wording that the city attorney advises to clean it up in here. If you go up to the top under the old policy. It was discretionary upon that with the city council. Well, two parts. If you read the first part, upon retirement, termination by city, or abolishment of the position, the city shall provide the following. So you're saying even though it was discretionary, no, no city council really had read it that way? Well, then it came down to then uh, that under number three, that the offering of that by the city is solely at the discretion of the council. And so in talking with the city attorney, every time we brought it to the council, uh, you, know, the, you know, there was the debate and the discussion and looking at it is that we really have a poor policy here is that it, uh, it says two different things. It says the city shall provide this, and then it's at the council's discretion. And in talking to the city attorney, uh, he said you, you really need to clean that up. And in most cases, when we brought those to the council, okay. the council has always approved that. Okay. So we, we kept along those lines that it, it generally has been done. And so it really, it, 
the discretion side of it came into the situation probably more. Uh, we had it occur one time besides upon retirement. Termination by the city, uh, I think there's a, a provision in another resolution that uh, in uh, reaching a, in, in one disciplinary action that I can recall, I think it gave the council some flexibility that uh, uh, on termination by the city, it gave them some discretion to pay out some sick leave. And in one other one, on the abolishment of a position, we abolished the planning position uh, uh, a number of years ago uh, when Renee was the planner uh, and we uh, discontinued the second planner position and abolished that. Uh, it was provided at that time as well. But other than those two instances, uh, every other time that it has historically been provided, any employee that we brought it to the council generally had 20 plus or more years of service to the city. So that's how we tried to grandfather it in. And so we moved that in as a payment under the sick leave. And then the, the portion relative to the, the six months of the single health, dental, and life, and again, that was approved by the council and has been provided some debate about whether that should continue, whether that's an appropriate piece to uh, put together. I think the estimated cost, and I'm trying to, to think a uh, single cost for single health, dental, and life, it was, uh, uh, that part of it uh, is about $3,200, I, I think, uh, if, if memory serves me correct. But we know uh, in taking a look at it that there's some that have raised the question, should this continue or not? And so in talking the alternatives uh, with the attorney and taking a look at it is that we thought, well, maybe it's appropriate that we keep it for all of the existing employees, but as we change and adopt and update this new policy, we no longer make that benefit available going forward uh, just because it's been called into question is that should we do that, should we not do it? So we preserved it for the existing group of employees but anybody who hired after the first of the year would no longer be eligible for that benefit. Um, and again, the only time that that's been paid historically is that it's been paid when uh, those employees have retired, uh, that that's been made available. One quick question here for you. We, we don't recon we don't have a, a workshop where we recodify. That, that's what I'm used to. The, the last city was, um, we actually had a workshop so we could go page by page, word by word, um, through a lot of the stuff just for recodification. Um, but because uh, it's a long period, taking each one of these things word by word like that, I'm just wondering, do we ever have a workshop um, over, like every five years where we recodify our, our books? We have taken actions over the last 11 years uh, to periodically amend or modify the, the various. Uh, different uh, individual policies, whether that was sick or vacation or, or something else. But uh, the, the wholesale going through the entire personnel policy, uh, no, that's not something that's done every uh, every year. And I, I mean, this, this has been a major undertaking to try to, to get this updated and put together, and that's why we had to solicit some outside help to uh, help us go through uh, this process. I'm not opposed to having some type of workshop and discuss each individual items it's in nice because if you stay on top of it then you don't have that you know it, it, like every uh, you know three to five years you you do it and then that way it's not such a big task and, uh, just uh, i think what rick is saying is, is basically getting that you know because obviously statues laws federal laws and all changes i think that's what rick's alluding to is that we go through this, you know, and I'm not saying the council does, but you know, we should make sure that, you know, you know, that we're just up to date any laws. But we'll be able to do that much better now that we go right. through this process and get it updated. But it's taken this amount of work to get this one because it had historically not been in the priority of projects and whatnot. Uh, uh, I can't tell you the, the volumes of hours that. Uh, Patty and finance and the department heads and myself has spent, uh, you know, over the last uh, six to seven months 
trying to go through this with uh, assistance to uh, to attempt to modernize it and update it. No, but I guess what I'm saying is, and I understand, Chuck, where you're coming from, to make sure that we're up to speed on all the laws, but I think a lot of these changes, there should be more, instead of cramming it in at 8 o'clock at night on number 9, uh, I'd like to sit down and discuss some of these things and see where the other, whether or not this is true that we want to offer this or we do want to go this direction or and have that, I don't think, it just seems very rushed that we've been waiting for this for a year and all of a sudden it's slotted in on number nine and we didn't, we don't really have a lot of time to go through and each get everybody's opinion on it. And uh, I had told the mayor that uh, if, if, you know, in putting it together, it has finally gotten to the point that we had something that we could put in front of you. We recognize that due to the timing and, and whatnot, is likely we would not be able to get through it and just exactly what you're talking about trying to either schedule this for a workshop or a sit down to just deal with this alone might be needed and so in that light uh, we're not asking to rush through and just adopt it and, and not do that and if the council's feeling this is you'd like to go to a workshop we can certainly schedule that well that and i have According to this, it says resolution approving the new freight personnel. So that's what I thought we were. But if you to. don't, if, if you don't get it set up for you to take a look at that, mm. right. we don't get the chance to get the feedback from you that you want to do that. So it's set up in that position. We could modify those items and uh, adjust and react to that. And if you're, if it's your desire that you want to say go into a, a workshop setting and to go through it page by page, uh, that can certainly be accommodated. Well, I don't even know if it needs to be necessarily a workshop as much as uh, maybe a smaller agenda item where we could spend more time and actually have more interaction amongst the... the it does have to be a workshop. And, um, you know, we, are you considered the HR then? Excuse me? Are you considered human resources for the city? Uh, well, both Patty and I kind of wear the hats to try to fulfill that side of the obligation within the organization, yes. And there is no, there is no committee that... Um, um, advises and uh, over, there's no oversight from a committee on um, um, no, this human resources. This is a council adopted policy and it's uh, my job to uh, implement it with assistance from the department heads throughout the organization. Would you guys be comfortable with that? I would be comfortable with that. With that with the workshop? Yep. Yeah. And, and that, that way we, and, and we consider it a recodification workshop where we actually go through page by page, you know, that way um, you don't got um, five opinions on it, you know, we all work together on it, and, you know, uh, instead of one of us just going, okay, what about this, what about, you know, it should be an and or an or, you know what I mean? So, I don't know, that, that's just kind of how I've always done it, so I, I just wanted to bring that up. I think I would prefer that we read the policy and uh, we each bring uh, a question, you know, our questions or our concerns, and then discuss just those items. I, to read it word for word, and you know, is uh, I don't think is necessary, but um, because I do have a couple of questions, so I think it would be a better venue to ask those questions, maybe in a in a full workshop. Yeah, I, I honestly didn't expect that you were likely going to just get a rubber stamp and adopt it. But until we get it to the stage and get it to you, we can't have this conversation. No, no, I no, that's right that you brought it forward. I mean, right. it gave us the idea of doing it, so. And if there's a rush on it or a time, you know, the, this needs to be done in a timely manner. We can pick a day right now, can't we? For, sure. The idea or the goal would be is for Ken to get it adopted retroactive to the first day. Or right. Just from an implementation and a management standpoint. That makes sense. Do you want to put your recommendation? Do you want to workshop so, then? Yeah, it sounds like the concept is everyone's is in tune with having a workshop. Yeah, I'm open. Whatever you guys got. Now, when do we? So, do you want us to just try to find some dates and propose that uh, back to you? That. Uh, you know, as, as we said, looking at it uh, already tonight, and we've got a special meeting to uh, to go and do it as well, is that uh, maybe we try to develop three alternatives or something, uh, kind of like we did budget workshops, uh, pick one of the upcoming meeting or uh, on Mondays or something, and uh, 
and then try to look at a 5.30 or a 6 o'clock and uh, have this as the only item on the agenda. I like that idea. I don't have my current yeah. calendar with me, so I don't know what. Yeah. I, I would encourage I you to please hold on to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering if, if, if the council uh, just let me just uh, comment or question some things just to give you context of some of the things I would like to get out of the thing. So some of the questions I have, if I could just mention a couple to think about, or at least so when we do meet, maybe we prepare to answer or look at them. Um, the holiday with the Good Friday, I'm supportive of that, but I'm wondering in the sense of providing service to the community instead of closing down and Christmas Eve, just giving another half day floater instead of closing the offices. Um, that's just a thought. I'm curious as to what the cost of the change and the vacation changes, what's the cost to the city? What's the estimated cost of that? The uh, memorandum talks about uh, acceleration of vacation has become more competitive in the marketplace. Was there work papers or are there supporting information to say that we're not competitive, but just to be able to see what supports that statement? Uh, I'm not, I think whenever you change benefits, it's a big deal. Um, so I guess that's why I would be cautious about all of this um, and what that we're supporting the action we're taking. Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know, Mike, if you, this probably predates you, so I don't know that you can comment about it, but this idea of paying um, accrued sick time, what, what's the philosophy behind that? Is that meant to be kind of retirement benefit? Or what's the, I'm, I'm just not used to that idea. Yes. So, never, and, I, never I, and, I, <laughs> and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, I don't, and I, I, but I'm wondering how is that thought I certainly don't want to take it away from uh, existing staff, but it's meant to be retirement. And I'm not sure it's really the fairest way to doing it. And well, I think there's a couple of things that come into play, and uh, no, I don't know the original uh, total uh, rationale be behind it, but part of it is is that there was never or uh, no longevity uh, compensation piece uh, added in there. Uh, number two, it was to try to discourage frivolous or unnecessary use of, of sick leave. And for those that saved it up, is that there was a way to, uh, you know, for not using that over the course of 20 plus years of service, that there was some payout as a, as a benefit uh, to the employees that, that were retiring. And as I said, you don't get it for just walking away in three years or five years or 10 years or 15 years is that it was intended for a retirement benefit uh, in, in that sense. And yes, uh, it may be different than what's in the private sector, and it may not be there, uh, but some form of either payout uh, of, of the sick leave or some longevity compensation, you know, typically is existing in other public sector uh, uh, agreements of that nature. And so. From a retirement standpoint, the city provides what kind type of benefits that really are more retirement? Are? Is it the nothing contribution Not to PARA? Uh, well, yeah, there is a yeah contribution and the employee contributes to uh, the PRA retirement. What does the city contribute to PARA? PARA is six. Is it six seven five? It's just like like. Um, I I'm out of blank, but I, 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 I believe it's about a 6.75 percent. <coughs> you guys don't qualify for Social Security. Yes, it, that's not it's only the police officers that do not pay Social Security, and so the city contribution on pair for police officers is more. We had all those numbers in the budgetary materials, and I don't have them in front of me. Yeah, I just so I want to try to be careful. Yeah. So yes, there's that contribution, but. Uh, this was the local benefit, and all I can tell you is that that provision has been in there, as, as best I can tell, going back to, uh, likely upwards of 20 years. Well, I think it's important that we think about retirement as a good benefit, what, and how we do that, whether we consider this as part of the retirement or, or not, I'm not sure, but. Um, so I just want to understand what we're providing now. So we're providing a para benefit, and 
and employees get Social Security. So that's the retirement currently. And then this could be thought as a retirement benefit because uh, it's paid at retirement. I, I think it's a cumbersome way of doing it and maybe not very fair. Um, in, in, in what regard? Well, if you have a 20-year employee uh, on his 20th year, gets in a car accident and is, uses up all their sick leave and then retires the next year, they get nothing. But the other individual that didn't get into the car accident gets all their unused sick pay. Had it been a retirement benefit, uh, whether you got sick or not, you still maintain it like an IRA or. But both of both of them would have gotten to use that benefit of the sick leave, whether one physically used it while they were still an employee, the other one getting paid for not having used it at the time that they're getting ready to retire. The way the way it's structured currently, but if you if you don't if you don't just get it then you retire structure it differently, differently, like I think what I'm more used to seeing, you have retirement. But, but, but again, yeah. we're, we're, we're not a banking operation, we're not the private sector. I'm not referring and, to banking, Mike. So. <laughs> well, but, but when you talk about the, the private sector, you can't compare necessarily what's out there and what's available there because there are nuances and differences between what has been historically provided to public sector employees, whether it's local government, whether it's in uh, the school district, whether it's in county government, you're going to see variables and things that are different than what you see. Or I totally seen agree and understand what you're saying, Mike, but we don't have the information. I don't have that information to know what what is a comparison. Is this a common benefit throughout all the municipalities or size or not? Or, or what? But in, so, attempting, in attempting to answer that one, the, the city's been providing this benefit right. for an extended period of time. You know, if, so I can't go out there and say it's in place because of all of this comparative stuff. No, but I think as we talk about a workshop, what are the issues and how we're going to talk about it? What does it mean to us and does it bring a change? And I'm not suggesting we take any benefit away from anybody, but there may be better ways of providing things to people. Under this scenario, it's fully taxable, as I understand it. Right. It's taxable no, not, income no, income. no, no, not necessarily. That if the oh, we have still as part of uh, our program that we made the switch to the HSA, but we also have uh, the VIVA component, where if an employee retires, they can take the contribution from the sick leave and or any accrued vacation if need be. And instead of that being paid to the employee, it can be deposited into that account and used for health purposes. Well, that'd be nice for you to walk walk through that with yeah. us because yeah, you can't see that, that and you can't read that from here. Yeah, and I think the employee needs to know how that works. So you're saying all 40, 480 hours could be tax exempt? Yes. For to all, the employee. all employees or just certain it, ones? It's only on payout at retirement is when this would come into play. And if they have it in the VIVA? It, it, the only way that they could receive a tax free <coughs> would be to deposit it, it into the VIVA. the VIVA. But if they just took the cash, it would be a taxable income? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I didn't So part of my point still stands. <laughs> yeah. But it is going away if I have one one twenty twenty. What is the payout of the accrued not the sick leave portion the portion the the second part of that benefit whereby it was provided that uh, the city paid up to six months of a single oh okay. uh, health okay. dental and life that's the piece that i'm saying uh, we would recommend that uh, that no longer be made available or offered okay yeah well i think i think the idea of a workshop yes we can go into more detail. So thank you. So Mike, you'll put some dates together for us. Okay. Ken, I think you're getting the next one. Yes, so regarding the rental dwelling unit inspection task force, we had uh, been advertising uh, for letters of interest from uh, looking for six members, two landlords, two tenants, and the two uh, at large. Uh, individuals, we uh, when I wrote the memo initially, we had two landlords and two tenants. 
um, that were interested, and then we did not have any uh, at-large uh, community members. We have one application for me that was not a resident, and we had talked. We wanted to make sure that the at-large were residents of the city. Uh, I did get a third landlord to uh, make application, but I would like to just extend out uh, the time period to the end of uh, January. Really wouldn't like to carry down any farther than that, but um, see if we can get some other uh, names to put in the hat so you guys can have. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not good with this. I'm not good with it at all. This is the third time that the council's looked at this, and um, now this task force, um, um, you know, it's like there is a, a we're definitely going to need other people. I mean, it's the same players on this task force um, that have been in here and testified in front of us. Um, and they weren't good with it. So I already know what they're going to say when they get into the task force. And, and rather than that, I'd rather start gathering more information. I mean, it, it was like um, 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 the uh, complaints that we had listed um, turned out to be from um, some of the same people over and over. And I, I don't know, I would like a more widespread piece of information um, on, on, on First of all, um, um, some of the uh, complaints that we get, mm -hmm. and, and then I would like some of them listed a little bit. So I don't know, I'm just not comfortable with this, and it is the third time we brought it up. I'd rather table this issue for a year. I don't, I don't want to see this again this year. I guess I'm not following. I would, I would like to counter your position ahead, by, by saying, um, I, I, I would like to try to get some at-large members. I think that could help. You want the two sides of the yeah, I don't want to keep hearing this over and over and over again. I mean, it was the same testimony from the same people, and um, it wasn't even good testimony. So it, it's like, and then the information we did get on the complaints that came in um, turned out to be somewhat not felonious, but um, incorrect, you know what I mean? They were from the same people about the same thing, and then um, um, one of the landlords had to be the one that explained it to me, um, and I just... If we got uh, um, something that you want us to consider, put it down in writing. We're going right. to We've already been over this. I and understand the council that. instructed Ken to go out and try to find get some task people force. to okay, get a task right force. Right now, together. on this task force, we're looking at the same. Yeah, I, I know, and that's why we're being asked to extend the time period I that think people the, apply. The holidays was a difficult time with that approaching and, and having that out there. I think we could get some at-large individuals out there. I don't want to have this drag on forever either. I think we need to have the task force meet and get information in front of you to look at and not waste your time at the council level, but gather the, the facts that we can have out there. Now, I would like that, but um, there would have to be some structure to it. You see, um, because it's going to be the same people that we've already heard. We, we already know what the task force is going to tell us. Well, I have a task force for something we already got the answer for. So I don't think the task, know, force, think tell us. The task force is going to tell us they don't want us to do these inspections for uh, uh, about a uh, hundred reasons. Um, and it turned out to be a big deal when it's really just our our staff is coming to us and asking us for a tool um, to do a job. And, and then that got so fogged out um, by um, the testimony that we were getting um, I don't know, it just seems like a, a redundant thing that we're doing here over and over and over again. All right, let's do the task force, but I'm telling you, they're going to come up with, they don't want to do it. Well, I agree that they probably don't want to do it, but All I, right, I don't well, think, then what do we need I don't, I don't think for? that was, at least my understanding, the council thing wasn't to say a task force is going to say inspections are no inspections. They're supposed to come up with a policy that I interpreted a policy that there's a vehicle that if someone has an issue with the rental thing, they don't have to go to Scott County, they don't have to go to Seward County, they don't have to go to the state of Minnesota. They have a person or an avenue right. here in the city. I agree. I agree. Now I that agree. may precipitate into an inspection if it's a life-threatening situation, mm -hmm. but. I never, you know, I'm not a believer that we're going to put everyone on a, an inspection cycle every three years or anything. That's not my my intent. What would you like to do? On, on, is it based on, on they call in and we say, okay, let's send an inspector over there. They got a complaint. Well, I would like to have them have an avenue that they can have someone local be able to, rather than, because like they said, people, I don't want to go to the county. I don't want to go to the, 
I would rather have an avenue that they have some kind of a person here in town that would talk to. They can sit and meet with that person. That person can then contact the landlord and say, okay, this is the complaint I got. The smoke detectors don't work and all this stuff, or whatever it is. And if it's a life situation type deal. I don't want to butt in on you, but that's exactly what happened with that lady that got thrown out of her apartment for um, because she was on a month to month. She went to the city, she complained, um, it went back to the owner, the owner said, all right, we're not gonna rent for you no more. Well, What, uh, what are you thinking is going to happen? I don't know. I'd like to just say, okay, um, I'd like him to set up. Okay, we could, if we get a complaint and we got to come in here and inspect, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And then that's it. Instead of saying, well, you know, an open ballpark, I mean, we're almost asking the robber to explain to us how he's going to rob the bank before he builds it. I think, I think also what was discussed is that the rental inspection, because we have a registration, the rental inspection was to inspect each rental property on some sort of rotational basis to ensure that it is up to code. And because that's, that, those are some of the concerns I think the city was getting and in the case of the, the woman that um, explained her situation, there was mold, there was water damage, there was you know other things going on and the landlord was not taking care of it and she wanted the city to, to come in and um, or the potential for the city to come in and inspect that rental property and um, not only inspect but to require yeah, uh, repairs be repairs. done yeah so you it's know, not there so much things like black mold and stuff like that um, but that black mold was there before they moved in they agreed to rent and well, they're renting it. We don't I mean, know. We, renting black we and we we don't know that. You know that's that is an assumption, um, but not just necessarily for someone to come to the city and the city acts as a mediator between the renter and the landlord, but to have the city actually be able to inspect that property on a rotational basis, and if there is a complaint, to be able to have the city enter that piece of property. Um, so that was my understanding anyway. And then the task force, you know, is, is tasked to coming up with what this would look like. <coughs> and, and make a recommendation. So, and it could be, you know, it could include some sort of mediation type of a situation. Um, but that is the reason for the task force is to have that discussion and come up with something that's reasonable. Yeah, we just had another um, call from a tenant actually yesterday. It was over the weekend, but um, we were asked to go out there look at the unit. It was an issue with uh, mold in an apartment unit. Um, the landlord had not been responsive in this particular unit, and we went out there, took a look at it, confirmed there was mold, and said, here's your uh, tenant handbook. So that now is frustrating for the tenant. But really, nothing more you can do at this point. No, there isn't. Well, so I the think tenant, the, the Chuck's did, point. Did the tenant get thrown out of their apartment for turning them in? Uh, this is a brand new thing that just came up. I don't, I don't know what will be the outcome. You see, the way we're doing it, I mean, that that, that just makes an avenue for retaliation. Um, if, if no, I'll, if, I'll, because he's going to be required to fix it. Why would he kick out the one person who complained? He still has to go and fix it before it can ever be rent it out again. It's not like he can kick them out and just leave it the way it is and hope the next one doesn't complain. That's what that Which is they, what we have now. Right. Exactly. Right. Well then what are we going to make up if we already got that now? And there's statutes against retaliation anyway. What we have now is that it continue to be rented just the next unsuspecting person. <clears throat> and they're never actually have to be heard. As landlord, they, they can do a rent abatement so they don't have to pay their rent until that gets corrected. Right. They pay their rent to the court. Yes. Correct. So they still pay their rent. It's just not held by the landlord. Right. Until that gets corrected. Until that gets corrected. That's what that the court process is. Yeah. The, the whole point of the local inspection ordinance, or maybe even not uh, a typical inspection ordinance, is to provide the local uh, involvement. And that's right. really what it is. Where the 
Okay, let's, do, let's go through that process. But uh, I'm just, I don't want the same players in this that have already been up here. I think that's where the, the at large is the important portion of it. And I think um, we need to do some more outreach for that. Can I just make a suggestion? Since you already have three landlords and you got a couple tenants, how about uh, uh, one of the council members volunteer their time, save your money on doing advertisement because obviously there's not a lot of interest from at large type people and get the process rolling. I would not advise to um, roll with the the names we've received so far only in consideration of the one. I agree. Okay. I think we need a bigger pool. Okay. So, so let's are you, are advertising and yeah so are you going to um, um go ahead and, and coordinate this? And then put some perimeters and some guidelines for the yeah for the task force. Okay. Certainly, once we have uh, names for you guys to consider, um, once we have all the categories filled, I think yeah, certainly we'll talk about what those parameters are and when the meetings will occur. And so moved. Okay. Thank you. Consent agenda. Does anyone have any questions or any issues on any items in the consent agenda? No, I move the consent agenda. I'll second. Okay, I got a motion Thank by Rick Seiler. Second by Sean Ryan. Consent agenda. There's no comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, now we're miscellaneous. Kirby, you want to say anything? I'm good. Okay. Mitch? Patrick, I have a request for a group photo before the beginning of this special meeting. Okay, we can do that. I'm just kidding, we don't make it out. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Um, is that it? Yep. Okay, Chris, do you have anything? James? Nothing. Bruce? Nope. Glenn? I have nothing. Ken? Nope. Michael? Nope. Fire? No. We're on a roll. Greg, you know? John? Yep, I do actually. Just a quick question to Bruce. Hey, with the mills closing, what uh, what kind of drain is that going to put on the budget for not selling that electricity and water? So, so what I did is I met with the commission um, last week, Monday, and went over some of the scenarios. There's still some ifs, Sean, in regards to what the what the final impact's going to be. Um, obviously, we know there's lots of revenue, and so what I did is I factored that into the budget and um, showed what that has potential of doing, um, and then also made some recommendation, recommendations in regards to continuing with our CIP projects that we have slated for this year. Um, we also had a little, uh, somewhat of a cash inflow from our power supplier on a settlement, and so that helped out for this coming year. And um, I don't foresee having it having an impact to, that we'd have to raise rates or anything like that this year. Raise rates or lay off anybody? No, or absolutely not. Okay. I just so, I have no idea what kind of impact that was. Right. So when do you think you'll have that maybe closed up for us to take a look at? I, I would. My recommendation would be that we would look at that um, like mid year, Sean, in regards to whether or not we want to make some budget revisions. Um, but as far as having to cancel projects or anything like that, no. Okay. We still still will be cash positive, so it doesn't put a, a deficit into the budget. Okay. And um, we're just gonna be cognizant of what what expenditures expenditures we make this year, if I need to adjust that a little bit, but um, still will be a positive budget. Okay. Could you um, uh, maybe give the council like a three year average of what the their average bill was? And I need to be a little cautious of that, Sean, just because it's some, when you, you can't really share billing data. So we can kind of share what some of the revenue impacts would be, but how it's one, one big customer. Right now, I need to be a little bit cautious of that yet, how they're still in business. So I can show the revenue impact to New Craig, but um, as far as their exact amount of what they paid to us okay, or whatever. I guess I'd, I'd be more be, interested in just the revenue impact. Yeah, I can do that. To New Craig. Anything else? No, that was it. Great. Uh, no, that was actually a good question. So go ahead. Okay. I got a few miscellaneous ones. I was on the golf board meeting. We had a telephone. Uh, I forgot who called in, but do we allow uh, telephonic uh, 
I know we can't do it on the council, but do we allow that for the committees? And well, Mike brought that change. Mike brought that to our attention that there are some rules in place that we should probably implement, um, and we've kind of decided as a golf board that we we would have had a forum even if Dan wouldn't have been there. Um, so that, but I, I guess we're supposed to post it somewhere is it in his location. Mike, is that it? There are certain state law provisions that have to be brought into play if that's going to, to be done. That's, that was my first experience uh, with uh, being involved with the Border Commission where somebody chose to call in. And so I indicated is that we're going to, if, if that is intended to be enabled or made available, then we need to take a look at the state law and see what we have to do to provisionally uh, comply with that. Yeah, I think uh, my understanding, at least from the council and, and um, ones that have the authority to act, uh, it's not allowed unless it's a military leave situation. But I didn't know since Gulf Wars is, is an advisory committee if that did, uh, maybe doesn't apply or something. No, it's, uh, I can't tell you because I haven't had a chance to go back and start to look at that. I've probed the, the question and uh, referred it to the city attorney so that we can take a look at it. I'd like to know too because they would consider doing that with me on the uh, um, community um, um, committee um, because of how far it is and in the winter I can't get up the sidewalk and so I would like more information on there as much as possible. Sorry. Yeah. And I know there's other ones that are involved and I'm not sure if the joint commission would be great. Uh, very well. <laughs> Sanitary service, I think they've done some telephonic and I'm not sure that that's for sure. So they're, 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 a se they're a separate legal board. They need to get advice from their attorney right. how to do that. Right, except we're a member of that board. Yes. That was the first time. Um, I just curious. Uh, the tobacco uh, law changed to 21 federally. And there was news in, over the weekend that some some uh, retail establishments are not complying. Do you know anything about whether our local are fully informed and do we need to change our ordinance to make it? Ultimately, we'll have to address our ordinance and change it. Um, right now, because state statute indicates that it is 18, that's what we in, would enforce right now. And because our ordinance doesn't say anything different, that's what we would, we would enforce. The state statute the law doesn't say 18. Our state statute does. Federal statute. Yeah, that's the federal. Yeah, the federal statute was the one that changed. Um, so they may be violating federal statutes, so the feds would enforce that issue. Um, at the same time, because they're licensed under the city of New Prague, because we, without going ahead and changing our ordinance immediately, um, we can't hold them to not selling to people that are 18 or older. Because we can't enforce federal laws. Right. Okay. Um, and the whole, the feds are going to come out with more information about their enforcement plan now, but ultimately they didn't have a plan, they just wrote it into law, slipped it in, and now that may be the law of the land, but now states and everybody else has to catch up with that. So if we do it, can't, can't you put it on the um, agenda for next meeting? And can't we just um, 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 make a, a we'll, we'll conform to federal law and change it to 21 right here, then make an ordinance? Can't we just do that? Just pose the question to the city attorney. We got a brief uh, <coughs> late this afternoon that I haven't even had a chance to look at as to how do we address and deal with this issue. And so likely we'll be talking about it at our staff meeting tomorrow and then taking a look at where we need to go with this. Because the world might end before the state does it. I mean, you know, they've been working on it for only two years, they got a 10 year window. They come, I think they come into session February 11th, does it? Yeah. yeah. They come back in. Well, the federal government will probably do like they did with 21 at the drinking. They'll say, oh, you're gonna lose funds and every state will yep. follow yeah. pretty quick. That is what they would plan to do with this. Yes. yes. So, but you don't have any information locally to know that retail uh, 
people are not complying with the federal law currently? Um, Barb had one call from one of the tobacco shops that inquired, are we enforcing that? Are other, and I think they ask, are other licensed establishments following the federal statute? Um, that was last Thursday, I believe, Correct. and uh, I did not, I did not see anybody with anything. Although that afternoon when I left, I stopped at Quick Trip. They had it posted right on their doors. They are only selling to 21 and older. Okay. Um, so I think, as a corporation, I think it's easier for them to say, "Hey, our policy is 21 and over now," because that's what the feds are telling us. So they can do that. But I did not make visits to every licensed establishment yet. Yeah, I just I'm surprised to hear that in the news that some stores are not complying on mm -hmm. purpose. So I didn't understand that. I was curious on the park minutes. It's interesting some of the the fitness question that you were going to get answered. Was that answered? The uh, oh, whether it's available to the male people? mile and the the, the Praha village, the community room. Yeah. Um, it's not open to the general public for either the mail mile or the community room. The community room is often available through community at events that you would then register for. Okay. So that's the answer. But you can't just go in and use the mail mile. You can't just go in and hang out in the senior room unless there's an event you have signed up for through community. Or you're a member of the fitness. Okay. The Woodchip Trail Grant, is, is that what the mail donated? Yes. To? Okay. And then is the city involved in that somehow? Nope. It was just a question they wanted information on, so. Thank you. Anything else? I don't have anything, so I guess I'll make a motion to adjourn. That's okay. Second by Rick Seiler. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Any opposition? We're out of here. Thank you, everyone. Good.